I am vengeance. I am the night. I am Batman. I've been doing this role for 30 years, which is pretty crazy for an acting job. It's a cultural icon. And to be a part of that, you know, it's, it's an honor. Never underestimate how much I appreciate each and every one of you and what you give me back for my performances. It means the world to me. Take care. By the end of 2011, Rocksteady Studios was on fire, having released two extremely well-received Batman games as part of their Arkham series. Their first game, Batman Arkham Asylum, was a smash hit, and not only was it an incredible Batman game, but it also proved that the superhero game genre could be taken seriously as award-worthy games. With such a striking success, it's hard to imagine them topping themselves in a significant way, but that's exactly what they did in the sequel, Batman Arkham City. Rocksteady's ambitions for Arkham City were much grander in scale, and it managed to improve upon their first game in almost every way. Rocksteady could do no wrong at this point, and fans were eager for more. With such success though comes equal pressure, and Rocksteady wanted to make sure they delivered a third game that would feel even bigger and better than the last. To fully accomplish their ambitions, they knew they would need additional development time compared to the prior games, which would be roughly three years. Other changes would be necessary as well to fully succeed on their vision. The first was that the next game would be a next-gen only title for the PS4 and Xbox One era of consoles. This new hardware allowed them to push beyond what they were capable of in the previous console generation, as explained by lead engine programmer Dustin Holm during an interview with Red Bull. Very early on, when we were looking at the scope of the game, we knew we wanted to make a bigger city, but we didn't really want to sacrifice that level of detail or level of content. So we figured that it wouldn't really work well with the previous generation. We knew that we wanted to jump onto next-gen hardware in order to maintain that really high level of detail. And it turned out there was power to spare so we could push the graphics side, we could push the level of detail up as well, make it render a lot better, and still keep all the content. We didn't have to put any caps on that side of things. To help put the new map size into context, Dax Jin stated during an interview with Game Central that, quote, It's about five times the size of the world we built for Arkham City, which makes it about 20 times bigger than what we had for Arkham Asylum. You can definitely feel this as you explore the three islands of Gotham, as well as its various interiors. However, you won't just be gliding to traverse Gotham, as a major aspect of Rocksteady's ambition was to introduce a playable Batmobile for the first time. In the prior games, we had only seen glimpses of the Batmobile, but never got to drive it ourselves, despite it being a major fan request. As to why it wasn't included in the prior games, game director Sefton Hill explains that, quote, You have to earn the right a little bit for these things. We really don't have a kitchen sink approach. We don't put everything in a game, see what sticks, take some stuff out, and then put some stuff in the next year. We tried to make something that is, everything in the game has to really justify its place in the game. The Batmobile's playable debut was no small feat either, as Rocksteady wanted it to be integral to the gameplay. The result was that the game was essentially built around the Batmobile, since it informed the level design and even Batman himself. In an interview with GamesBeat, Dax Jin describes their challenges with creating this new open world. Designing the game world to make sure it feels authentic was one thing, but then designing it to fit the Batmobile, a hand-in-glove kind of connection, we had to design the layout of the city and the functionality of the Batmobile at the same time, so that the power fantasy of driving the Batmobile through this legendary city felt the way everyone imagines it should feel. Fast, destructive, powerful, all of those things. It's as much to do with the design of the city as the design of the Batmobile. Rocksteady also wanted to highlight the man and machine kind of bond between Batman and the Batmobile, and based his suit on its design. Seeing the two next to each other, you can see how they mirror each other in appearance, with Batman's new suit taking on a more armored look compared to the previous games. 
Another big change that would occur in the third game was that it would actually receive an M rating. An M rating is essentially the equivalent of an R-rated movie, meaning that the ESRB has dubbed it as too mature for younger audiences. This may not seem like a big deal, but it can be a big problem for some game publishers since an M-rated game can't be sold to anyone younger than 17 years old, which could potentially hinder sales. Rocksteady didn't write the game with an M rating in mind and just told the story they wanted to tell, so naturally, game director Sefton Hill was in quite a panic when he heard the news, which he describes in an interview with IGN. I was really freaked out because the solution was to lose the scenes, but they were key scenes, we couldn't lose them. I got the email, I freaked out, I thought this was going to destroy the game, everything I'm passionate about, I was building myself up for this big argument, I didn't get much sleep. Thankfully, Warner Brothers was willing to keep the M rating instead of cutting sections of the game out. So what were these scenes that were so bad in this game? Well, I'll call them out as they occur during the story section, but just as a teaser, here's a section from the ESRB's explanation of what justified the rating. Some sequences allow players to use tank-like vehicles with machine gun turrets and rockets to shoot enemies. A vehicle's wheels are also used to torture an enemy in one sequence. Cutscenes depict characters getting shot on and off camera while restrained or unarmed. Large blood stains, pools of blood appear in crime scenes and in the aftermath of violent acts. One room depicts a person torturing a character on a bloody operating table. During the course of the game, players can shoot unarmed characters and a hostage. Neon signs in a red light district read, Live Nude Girls and XXX. The words bitch, gobshite, and ass appear in the dialogue. Firstly, as someone from the States, I've never heard the word gobshite before and had to look that one up. Apparently, it's an offensive word for a person who you think is stupid or says things that you think are silly or not true, which doesn't sound too bad. The other reasons listed for the M rating doesn't sound that bad either, honestly, although I will admit a couple moments in the game were a bit darker and more jarring. But as I mentioned, I'll call these specific scenarios out as we reach them in the game's story. Speaking of story, the writing team is a bit different this time around as well, since it doesn't include Paul Dini. If you're unfamiliar with the name, Dini developed and wrote Batman the Animated Series and contributed to writing Batman Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. I've seen rumors online that suggest there was some bad blood between him and Rocksteady, but after reading his quote on the matter, it sounds like he just took on other work in the meantime and became unavailable. The last talk I had with Warner Interactive about future games was while I was doing promotion for Arkham City last September. Naturally, as there was such a rush of interest about Arkham City, everyone was asking me about a third game and frankly, I had been wondering about that myself. When I asked about the possibility of working on a third game, I was told that as Rocksteady had just finished wrapping the second one, it would be a while before everyone was ready to sit down and discuss future plans. That said, it was intimated that for future games, Warner and Rocksteady might not be looking as much to freelance writers, the message being that if I had something else interesting coming my way, I might want to take it. Rocksteady instead chose to use a team of in-house writers, and the result is the game we'll be discussing today, Batman Arkham Knight, which after a couple delays, released in June 2015. Before we dive in, I should mention how I played this game, which was on the PC version. If you recall, the Arkham Knight's PC launch was notoriously bad, suffering from a series of bugs and performance issues that forced Warner Brothers to remove it from digital and physical stores and offer refunds on it. It was quite the controversy, with QA testers even giving anonymous quotes to Kotaku regarding their frustrations that these issues weren't fixed ahead of time. For example, here's a couple quotes. I will say that it's pretty rich for WB to act like they had no idea the game was in such a horrible state. It's been like this for months, and all the problems we see now were the exact same, unchanged, almost a year ago. We reported literally thousands of bugs that were specific to the PC version relating to the frame rate. All sorts of effed up texture issues, the Batmobile in particular has always effed up things on the PC. Despite the issues that the PC version launched with, patches have since been released to help remedy those issues, along with the ability to customize the graphical quality of the game to your setup. Technology has also improved quite a bit since 2015, making it easier to run the game with modern PC hardware compared to what was available back then. Due to this, I think the PC is now the best way to experience this game if you have a reliable gaming setup, even compared to playing Arkham Knight on modern consoles like the PS5. For example, the PC version allowed me to enhance the frame rate above 60 frames per second. There's a maximum of 90 frames per second in the settings, but you can remove this cap in the game files and essentially make it unlimited. When I tested this, there were moments where I was over 200 frames per second when playing at a 1080p resolution. For this video though, I ended up sticking with the 90fps setting within the game, only because higher frame rates along with the screen recording software was running my PC a little too hard. I did however boost the graphics to 2K to hopefully help showcase just how beautiful this game is and how it still outshines the graphics of a lot of games even today. Although I can almost guarantee that after rendering and uploading this all to YouTube, that the visuals won't match the quality you'd experience when playing it for yourself. 
It should still look visually impressive, but on your actual hardware, the game looks breathtaking. So basically, if you have a gaming PC and have been hesitant to try Batman Arkham Knight, try it. The graphics are absolutely gorgeous and are further enhanced if you can achieve higher frame rates to really get that smoothness in the gameplay. However, some issues still persist, and I will say that frame drops still occurred at times, especially during Batmobile sections, but it's worth it nonetheless. All that to say that I played the game at a 2K resolution at 90 frames per second, and that the vast majority of clips you'll be seeing in this video come from the PC version of the game. Additionally, if you enjoy this video, I'd appreciate it if you gave it a like, since that helps it to reach more viewers, and if you'd like to see more videos like this one, you can subscribe to see all the new videos as they release. You can also follow me on Twitter for updates on everything regarding the channel. By the way, this video will be part 1 of 2 due to the vast amount of content within the game. So in this video, we'll focus primarily on the main story, as well as the easter eggs and behind the scenes details within it. In the next video, we'll talk about all the DLC, side missions, and challenges, along with other aspects of the game like the gameplay and audio design. So you can look forward to that releasing soon too. But without further ado, let's get into the story of Batman Arkham Knight. Before we get into the main story of Arkham Knight, let's first recap some important moments from the last game. In Arkham City, Joker was dying due to his toxic blood as a consequence from his time as Titan Joker in the Asylum. To assure himself a cure, he decides Batman is his best bet, so he injects his infected blood into Batman so that they'll both be contaminated. One aspect of this plot that is easily overlooked though, is that the Joker has also sent his infected blood to hospitals around Gotham, in hopes that he'll infect random citizens as well, to further motivate Batman to find a cure. So we both die. I'm fine with that. Are uh, you? Imagine, sucking down that last breath knowing that Gotham is doing the same. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, didn't I say? I've spent weeks shipping samples of my blood to emergency rooms all over the city. So even though it's not really addressed much in Arkham City, we'll see how this side plot of the Jokers has had major ramifications for the events of Batman Arkham Knight. As you likely remember though, Batman managed to find a cure to save himself from death, but Joker accidentally broke the vial and ended up dying from his own actions. Even one year after these events, which is when Arkham Knight takes place, the citizens of Gotham still don't know what happened between Batman and Joker in those final moments, which has led to many rumors regarding whether or not Batman actually killed him. Nonetheless, the Joker is legitimately dead, which means for the first time in the Arkham game series, we'll have a lead villain that won't be him. Still, the Joker manages to loom large in Batman Arkham Knight, and we even begin the game with him as his body is placed in an incinerator to be cremated. It's really creepy to be this close up to his dead, smiling body, and I found it to be really effective in a number of ways on my first playthrough. To start, it feels like a goodbye to the character since we think we won't see him again, and it's a bittersweet moment. I'm glad that Joker is done and a new villain can take the spotlight, but Joker has been such a charismatic and amusing villain, I never quite want to be finished with him. In a way, it helps me to empathize with how Batman has been taking the Joker's death, because as we saw in the Harley Quinn DLC, he's not excited, but instead a little bit conflicted. He and Joker had a strange sort of relationship, and with the Joker gone, things feel different. The other reason why I think this cremation scene is effective is because right off the bat, it tells the player Joker is legitimately dead. He's not coming back to life in the Lazarus Pit or anything like that, as we even get to pull the switch and burn Joker ourselves. I have more that I'd like to discuss about this cremation scene later on, but for now, the fires of the incinerator transition us into the Burning Bat logo as we get some really striking first lines from Commissioner Gordon. This is how it happened. This is how the Batman died. Yes, the first lines of the game state that this is the story of Batman's death. So quite a lot is going on in just the first few moments of the game, and it raises a big question. Will Rocksteady actually kill off Batman by the end of this game? Prior to this game's release, Rocksteady made it clear that Batman Arkham Knight is their finale, and they won't be making a fourth Arkham game. So knowing that and pairing it with Gordon's statement about Batman's death, you have to think there's a good chance they're serious. It's a very bold move, and it's a great hook for the beginning of the game. Gordon continues his voiceover as he fills us in on what Gotham has been like in the past year since Arkham City. Surprisingly, things have been pretty good. Crime has actually gone down significantly, and things are looking up. Gordon realizes this is strange though, considering there should be a big power struggle after the Joker's death. So while Gotham City is happy, Gordon feels the trouble is just bubbling under the surface. This transitions us into our next playable character, a random Gotham City cop named Officer Owens. 
Officer Owens is entering Polly's diner to get something to eat, and this diner is a callback to the Arkham Asylum game. During the opening shots of that first game, you can see a sign for Polly's Diner, which itself was likely named after Paul Dini, who helped write the first two games. I thought this was a really cool callback, and after having seen it off in the distance in the first game and now getting to walk inside it, it gives you a sense of expansion and comparison, since it feels like we're expanding further and further into Gotham City with each game. So I like that Rocksteady chose this location to start in. I also love that the game takes place on Halloween night, and how Halloween influences the design and atmosphere along with certain story aspects. Inside the diner itself though, there's a surprising amount of easter eggs, storytelling, and background information within it. So much so that I had to replay it multiple times because just looking in certain directions at certain times can mean you miss the other things going on around you. The setup is pretty simple though. Officer Owens is sitting down at the diner to have some coffee and food. While he's sitting, there are a few things you can spot. The first is a missing poster for someone named Henry Adams, an important character we'll be introduced to later on. If you look to your left, you can also watch an interaction where one of the waste disposal workers scares a man in a Batman mask, which I think is meant to tease the upcoming conflict between Scarecrow and Batman, especially since we'll see that Scarecrow has the upper hand for most of this game. Afterwards, a customer comes to tell us that there's somebody smoking in the corner booth, requesting us to have a word with him. From here, we're able to free roam the diner and examine it closer. On the TV are various news headlines, one of which states that Arkham Asylum is set to be reopened after Arkham City's shutdown. On a newspaper in front of us, we can also see that Bruce Wayne is pledging $300 million into redeveloping Arkham City in order to clean it up and revamp it. There are a few missing persons headlines as well. One mentions the ongoing hunt for corporate killer Christina Bell. We can also listen to a couple having a conversation about her in one of the booths. Christina Bell is said to have murdered the board members at Queen Industries, where she worked. By the way, Queen Industries is owned by Oliver Queen, aka the Green Arrow, so a little easter egg there. But anyway, the girl on the right worked with Christina and is telling the guy about her experiences with her. She describes how after Christina went for a hospital visit, she came back almost like an entirely different person. She also apparently had a deep fascination for Batman, but a strong hatred towards Robin, as you can hear in this clip. Also, keep an ear out for the music in the background, which we'll discuss soon as well. So I got mugged, right? In the Diamond District a few months back. And I told her. And as I was describing it, her eyes lit up. It was creepy. What'd she say? She just kept asking for more details. Did they have a knife? Did Batman show up? Did they have guns? Did Batman show up? Did they hurt me? Did Batman show up? Well? Well, what? Did Batman show up? No. But Robin did. Oh, okay. I guess that's cool. Ugh, you're worse than her. The second I said Robin's name, she looked so disappointed. Then angry. Yeah, well, Batman's cooler. You know what she said? She said that she'd rather be gutted and left on the street than rescued by him. And then she looked at me like I was dirty. The song in the background is Only You by The Platters, which is the song that the Joker sings to Batman during the credits of Batman Arkham City. Going back to this conversation though, we can hear more details about Christina Bell's murder of the Queen Industry board members, as well as her personality during it. Look, I'm just not seeing it. This woman's been perfectly normal for as long as you've known her. She says a couple of odd things around the office and then one day walks into the boardroom with a gun? It wasn't a gun. Oh, sorry? A sharp object. That's what the report says. Oh, really? Yep. And there were like 10 guys in there, I think. Maybe more. Huh. And you're sure she wasn't, I don't know, kidnapped by the real killer? CCTV shows her walking out of the building by herself. With blood on her hands. Wow. She spoke to me on her way out. She did? I must have missed her hands. What'd she say? She said, her favorite thing about glass ceilings is playing with the shards. God. I thought it was like a pep talk. Man, maybe it was. Don't. Christina Bell definitely sounds intense, and we'll see that head-on as we're introduced to her later in the game. The TV references another missing person though, this time the McCallum Academy principal. This is actually Henry Adams, who we also saw the missing poster for. Another missing person is an ex-champion boxer named Goliath, who has gone missing after randomly attacking some people. We can find a flyer for his championship fight against Ted Grant, aka Wildcat, but it's been cancelled due to the disappearance of Goliath. 
Ted Grant is an easter egg as well, since in the comics, he's a boxer who becomes the vigilante Wildcat. The final missing person alluded to in the diner is stage performer Johnny Charisma, whose flyer we can find. Johnny has also gone missing, and this show has been cancelled as well. There's also a headline regarding Arkham City compensation claims. After Hugo Strange's Protocol 10 catastrophe, where he incarcerated inmates and other citizens within Arkham City with the goal of killing them, the legal system was forced to compensate everyone involved. This meant that inmates were given money, and they were all released and put back on the streets. This makes it even more suspicious that crime has gone down, considering there have been more criminals on the streets than ever before. We can actually hear more about this if we go listen to the guys at this booth. Two of them work for the Hell's Gate Disposal Service, while the guy at the top left is currently unemployed. All of them were criminals being held in Arkham City during Hugo Strange's attack, and all of them have been released and paid their compensation. The problem, though, is that the unemployed guy already spent his entire compensation package. He also describes how someone is sending the tally man after him. Yeah. I'm kind of broke. I don't really know how it happened, but I got my payout last Friday, and then things get kind of blurry. And now I owe six guys money. One of them threatened to send the tally man after me. The tally man? Bad news. Guy's a pretty good shot. I heard he took out some guy's kneecaps in Arkham. From Blackgate. I know, okay? I know. So what am I gonna do now? The tally man is a villain from the comics who collects debts for the mob. We'll unfortunately never see him in this game, but he's a cool reference nonetheless. This conversation continues though, as the unemployed guy needs a way to make money fast and pay back his debts. His buddy across from him says that he could get him a job with waste disposal, saying they need a man with his expertise to help them secure all the totally worthless waste that they'll be transporting. The insinuation being that the Hell's Gate Waste Disposal Company is a front for illegal activities, and we'll later learn that Scarecrow is using them to transport his fear toxin. This also shows us where all these ex-cons have been going after Arkham City, and what they've been doing since then instead of causing more crimes. We can also see a recruitment poster on the board in the diner for Hell's Gate, advertising specifically towards ex-cons. Among these flyers are more teases at what's to come, including one for Stag Industries. They're also promoting a way to earn money quickly, but as a participant in their human trials. As we'll see later, you'd probably be better off taking the Hell's Gate job. Towards the top is a flyer for legal services for those who were injured in Arkham City. Strangely, we'll learn that this is also handled by Hell's Gate. There are also some posters on the walls advertising various DC Comics locations. For example, here's one for Markovia, a country associated with the characters Geoforce and his half-sister Terra. Another advertises Vladova, a country associated with the villain Count Vertigo, who is a descendant of Vladova's royal family. This next one will actually be recognizable though, as it advertises a trip to Metropolis, the home of Superman. As you explore the diner some more, you'll notice a bunch of Halloween decorations, but I want to call attention to this setup in particular because I think it's a reference to the main players in this game. This could be a reach, but I'm going for it anyway. Firstly, there are six bats hanging here, which I think could reference six members of the Bat family in this game. Batman, Alfred, Robin, Nightwing, Batgirl, and the surprise character that I shouldn't mention just yet. Then looming behind them is Scarecrow. In front of them are two ghosts, who I'd argue are two dead characters important to Batman. One of which would be the Joker, and the other would be the same mystery character again. Maybe this is just me seeing Jesus in the toast, but I thought it was worth mentioning, and at the very least, I like how these designs in particular add to the atmosphere of the diner. There's still more conversations going on around us though that we can check in on too. For example, this group of four guys are chatting about their frustration towards the Arkham City compensation plans, and how it'll impact their taxes. On the table are some masks that I found interesting. In the center is one for Batman, and closer to us is a pretty creepy one that a lot of Hell's Gate guys wear, and I think this is meant to be associated with Scarecrow. But the most interesting one is the bunny mask at the end of the table, which is the same one Mad Hatter uses on his victims to mind control them. If we revisit the guy in the Batman mask, he'll have a bunch of different comments regarding the guy who scared him, but I like how he eventually does the I'm Batman line as a callback to some of the movies. Besides, I wasn't afraid. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. There are more conversations in this diner, but I think those were the important ones. Also, I like how the vast majority of the face models used for the characters in the diners are various employees at Rock City. You can even see the two writers at the very beginning. Writer and game director Septon Hill can be spotted leaving as soon as you enter, and another writer, Ian Ball, pays his tab and leaves very early on as well. It's almost like they knew something bad was about to happen here, probably because they wrote it. Speaking of which, let's get to the guy smoking in the corner booth. As we approach, he has his back turned to us, and we can see he has a bag on the table that's releasing smoke. 
When we go to confront him, he instantly turns into a zombie-like creature, and the world around us becomes much more nightmarish. That's because the bag was releasing fear toxin the whole time, and now we're hallucinating our fears. To me, the creature Officer Owens is hallucinating looks a lot like the mask we saw earlier on the table, as well as a Halloween poster with the same design, and I wonder if we're meant to believe that Owens has been seeing that creepy mask around the diner, or even throughout the city, to the point it became a subconscious fear, and manifested itself when he came in contact with the fear toxin. Regardless, Owens is terrified as everyone in the diner starts attacking each other. He pulls his gun, and you can choose to either start shooting everyone, or refrain from killing. Whichever you choose will have an effect on Officer Owens' life as we see him throughout the game, which we'll discuss a bit later. At this moment though, the perspective changes to a crowd watching the news, which is broadcasting the attack, as well as the identity of the original attacker, who appears to just be a random scarecrow thug, who might even be dead. We're then introduced to Scarecrow, as he broadcasts to the city. This demonstration used just five ounces of my latest toxin. Tomorrow, this will seem like child's play. Gotham, this is your only warning. The last time we saw Scarecrow, he was getting mauled by Killer Croc in the sewers of Arkham Asylum. He was then noticeably absent from Arkham City, but we still found hints that he was planning to make a comeback. Now it seems he's ready to unleash his plan on Halloween night, and this feels like a much different Scarecrow compared to the one in Asylum. We only get a glimpse at Scarecrow's new look here, but he's undergone a pretty extensive design change. If you recall from Batman Arkham Asylum, he had a unique look with the Freddy Krueger glove of fear toxin injectors, as well as the hooded burlap mask complete with the noose around the neck. The rest of his clothing was pretty minimal, with just some cloth around the collar, leaving the rest of his torso exposed. When we compare this to his new design in the model viewer, we can see just how much Scarecrow's look has changed due to his injuries from Killer Croc. Some elements of the last design are still present, like the noose on the neck and the toxin syringes on his hand, but I mostly want to focus on the differences. To start, his body isn't exposed like it is in the last design, and he's instead covered from head to toe in this cloak, likely due to the scarring from the Killer Croc attack. He's also completely wrapped in fear toxin, and to me, its appearance is sort of reminiscent to a suicide bomb vest, which I think is clever because it makes you want to keep your distance away from him. I doubt he's very capable physically, so intimidation is likely his best tool against adversaries. To go along with that, we get a hint at how the croc attack has physically hindered Scarecrow based on the brace on his left leg. What I love the most about this new design though is his face. It looks like instead of burlap, it's now bandaging that covers his face, and the way it's torn around the mouth makes it look like it all used to be one piece until he ripped it to expose his mouth. I don't even think he has lips, the way his teeth are exposed. I think the way they whitened out his eyes too was really clever. We can read a lot from a person by looking into their eyes, and with Scarecrow's being essentially hollow in this way, we can never get a solid read on him, which causes him to feel even more unnerving on a more subconscious level. Scarecrow seeming devoid of emotion is further reinforced with the new voice actor that was selected for him, Jonathan Noble. For comparison, in Arkham Asylum, he was voiced by Dino Andrade, whose take was more zany and maniacal, which I liked in that game and I think it fit the character there. One step closer and this goes into the water. The cave will fill with your deepest, darkest nightmares, and you will never reach your precious venom roots. <laughs> Scarecrow has changed a lot since we last saw him though, and Jonathan Noble gives him a voice that is more calm, subdued, and methodical, which surprisingly makes him feel more intimidating. He sounds like he's determined and serious about what he's planning, and the new voice goes a long way to sell that. Gotham, this is your only warning. But after Scarecrow's broadcast, panic engulfs Gotham and the citizens are swiftly evacuated. The city is now empty, except for the citizens who chose to stay. However, the ones that stayed are primarily criminals and the police. The criminals are winning so far and rampaging through the city. We also get a glimpse at a surprising team up between Penguin and Two-Face, who were leading rival gangs last we saw of them. They temporarily put their differences aside and formed a truce. Of course, there's still one other key citizen who elected to stay in Gotham, as we're finally introduced to Batman, standing atop a tower overlooking Gotham. This is one of my favorite shots in the game, because we get a great sense of the size of Gotham, as well as the beauty of this game. These close-up shots of Batman really demonstrate that well, as we can see how detailed the Batsuit is, along with the raindrops sliding down it, with the moonlight in the background. It looks incredible, and I think it's a great way to introduce him. This is also the moment we're introduced to the open world, and we can view its entirety from this tower. Off in the distance, we can see some other key locations as well. 
First, to our left, we can see the location of the first game, Arkham Asylum, still wrapped up in Ivy's plants. To the right of it is a new location, which just so happens to be an abandoned amusement park. We'll get to explore that in detail when we get to the Batgirl DLC in the Part 2 video. And to the right of that, we can see the location of the last game, Arkham City. Seeing it off in the distance here really puts it into perspective just how large the explorable area of Gotham City is in this game, since Arkham City is probably about the size of just one of the islands in Arkham Knight. From here, we glide to the GCPD police station to meet with Commissioner Gordon. When we arrive, we catch him in the middle of a phone call with his daughter Barbara, and he mentions that he's glad Barbara was able to safely evacuate Gotham. Gordon then gives us the lowdown on the city, and how the criminals currently have the upper hand. Batman gives Gordon a bat phone to keep in touch, and their conversation is interrupted when Gordon receives a report of a missing police car and officer down. Batman makes a stealthy exit, and contacts Oracle to locate the missing police car. Oracle is Barbara Gordon, Commissioner Gordon's daughter, and he's unaware that she works with Batman. We'll also learn that Barbara has been lying to her dad about evacuating the city, and has instead decided to stay to assist Batman. She's able to locate the missing police car and officer though, so we head there next. We find the officer surrounded by criminals, so we drop in to fight them. This is our first combat encounter, and just in this early segment, I can already tell the gameplay is a lot more refined. Batman has new animations, the combat feels smoother, and I got to utilize a new system where you can grab an enemy's melee weapon and use it against them. Batman gets new attack animations while wielding the weapon, and I thought this was a really fun inclusion to the combat mechanics. After defeating all the enemies, we help the officer up right as a vehicle speeds towards us. Batman grapples the officer to a nearby rooftop for safety, while he plans to take the fight to the enemies. The officer asks what he plans to do, which leads to a pretty badass line from Batman. The city's overrun. We don't stand a chance. Stay here. I'll send someone to pick you up. What are you doing? Evening the odds. Batman's idea of evening the odds is to call in the Batmobile, and we get a really cinematic sequence as it's introduced to us for the first time. I've gotta say, I'm really loving the visual style of this game so far. Not even just in the design of the characters and locations, but in the way these scenes are shot as well. The cutscenes are a lot more cinematic compared to the previous games, which is further pulling me into each moment. I think the Batmobile looks great too. It has that sleek, narrow design that we've come to expect from other classic Batmobiles, like in the Tim Burton Batman films and the animated series. But I like how this version is a lot more modernized and heavy duty. From here, we get to drive the Batmobile for the first time as we pursue the vehicle that attempted to run us over. In these early moments driving it, I felt like it drove very smooth and was relatively easy to handle. It can take a minute to get used to, but throughout the game, I never felt like it was a mess to control. I was actually surprised at how fluid the controls felt for the Batmobile, especially since Rocksteady had no previous experience with driving games up to this point. In an interview with Game Central, Dax Jin was asked if they looked at racing games for inspiration for the Batmobile, and this was his response. Not really, no. The way that we have coded the behavior of the Batmobile and thought about the Batmobile is we used the same team that created Batman. So the core gameplay programmer that created Batman for Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, he's the guy that's working on the Batmobile. We didn't want to just bring in a driving team because then we would have ended up with a Batman game that had a driving component. We wanted the two things to feel married. I'm sure it was tempting to consult a team specialized in racing games to work exclusively on the Batmobile, and using the designers who worked on Batman's gameplay may seem unconventional at first, but I think this ended up being the right approach and really paid off. The Batmobile does in fact feel married to the gameplay of Batman, and you can seamlessly transition between the two. I'll definitely talk more about the Batmobile and its role in the game as this video continues, but for now, I'm loving this introduction, and I'm having a lot of fun speeding through these streets trying to apprehend the enemy vehicle. Once we stop the vehicle, we find the driver attempting to crawl away, so we take the opportunity to interrogate him about Scarecrow. Without hesitation, he tries to inject us with something, which Batman takes to analyze later. Now that he's pissed Batman off, it doesn't take much persuasion to get him talking. He says that all he knows is that Scarecrow is operating out of a penthouse in Chinatown. That's enough of a lead for Batman, and he concludes this interaction with one of my favorite lines in the game. I swear that's all I know! If you're lying, I'll break the other one. With the enemy down, Batman takes a moment to analyze what he can about the injector and learns that it's Scarecrow's new toxin. He then uploads the information to Oracle to investigate in the meantime while we head to that penthouse. When we arrive, we're surprised to find a bunch of Scarecrow's militia guards holding Poison Ivy captive. We crash the party and fight off the guards until there's only one left inside the chamber with Poison Ivy. He attempts to use her as a hostage to escape, but Scarecrow decides to gas the chamber instead to use them as a demonstration for Batman. In another surprising turn of events, Poison Ivy is fine, stating that she has a natural immunity to the fear toxin. 
As she exits the chamber, we get another callback to Arkham Asylum, as this shot is made to be reminiscent of her emergence from her cell in that game, which I thought was a nice touch. Now that she's free, she tells us why she was being held prisoner. It started with a meeting. What meeting? Everyone was there. Penguin, Two-Face, Riddler, even poor Harley. Scarecrow said he had a plan. That together we could take you out, and Gotham would be ours. Over my dead body. I believe that was the idea. I told him that I wasn't interested in his pathetic human games. And when I came to, I was locked up in that room. We never get to see this meeting in the game, but there are some shots of it elsewhere, one of which is from a concept art showing them all together. Even better though is this brief shot from one of the trailers where we can see their actual in-game models. It seems that Ivy was the only one to turn Scarecrow down, which is why he made her an enemy. Regardless, Batman still fully intends on throwing Poison Ivy back in jail, so he leads her out the building. However, their exit is interrupted by more militia troops who quickly surround them. At this moment, you're meant to call in the Batmobile to take them out, but if you stall, you can get some extra voice lines from Ivy, who talks to you like you're a gobshite. You could just surrender. Do you even have a plan? Are you trying to stare them into submission? If you do nothing here, they will eventually shoot you, and I was surprised to get a death scene featuring Alfred, who we never really get to see in person. Master Bruce, I hoped it would never end like this. Rest in peace. When you do this section correctly though, you remotely control the Batmobile to roll up and take everyone out. It's also explicitly stated that the Batmobile fires non-lethal rounds, so you know that Batman isn't killing them, just incapacitating them. This is also our introduction to the Batmobile's battle mode, where it goes on the offensive with its top-mounted cannons. I think this was a cool idea to give the Batmobile the capability to transform based on the scenario at hand, and it makes the Batmobile feel like a hybrid between the classic Batmobiles that I mentioned earlier, with the more tank-like interpretations from movies like Batman Begins and Batman v Superman. In this section, we get to test out the Batmobile's battle mode as we take on the swarm of militia tanks. This is essentially how the rest of the Batmobile combat sections will go, where we dodge the incoming blasts and attempt to take out the opposing tanks as quickly as possible. This first section is pretty basic though, but both sides get more advanced weaponry as the game progresses. But as far as this first mission goes, I'm enjoying the battle mode and I think it's a clever implementation so far. After clearing the area, we put Poison Ivy in the trunk and drive her to GCPD lockup. Once there, we place Ivy in her own isolated cell for safekeeping. That's one less villain to worry about, but there's still plenty more to deal with. In the meantime though, we can explore the police station and there are a couple neat inclusions. The first is their evidence room, full of items recovered from various Batman villains. First, we'll find a case containing one of Riddler's trophies, and we can actually break the glass and claim it. Like with the previous games, Riddler has hidden trophies and puzzles all over the city that we need to solve to complete his side mission, which we'll further discuss in the Part 2 video. There are a ton of other display cases though, and Officer Aaron Cash has audio commentary for each one. For example, they have Mr. Freeze's freeze gun, and Cash states that Freeze has gone under the radar since the events of Arkham City. Next to that display is one for Great White Shark, aka Warren White, which holds a jar with something in it. You might recognize this from the first game, since you can find it in the morgue. I go into a lot more detail on Great White Shark's origins in the video for that game, but essentially, this jar contains various body parts that once belonged to him. Gross, right? Similarly, although we never encounter the ventriloquist, we do find his gun in Arkham Asylum, and it's now here in Evidence Lockup. We get another callback to Arkham Asylum when we visit Joker's case, containing some of his gag weapons. On the left is his toy gun that he uses to shoot vials of Titan Serum into people, including himself. Then the next three are gadgets of his that you could use in the challenge maps on PlayStation, where he was an exclusive character. The Chattering Teeth were essentially a remote-controlled bomb you could deploy in stealth missions. There's also his pistol that could be used as well, but only contained one bullet. Lastly are these X-ray glasses, which were his version of detective mode, but not nearly as useful. So it's pretty cool to see Rocksteady reference these gadgets and think back on where we started compared to where we are now. Continuing through Evidence Lockup, we also find the swords of Ra's al Ghul, the man pulling the strings during the events of Arkham City. Last we saw Ra's, he was dead, impaled by his own sword. However, in Cash's audio report, he states that they found these swords at the bottom of the tower, but Ra's body was gone, so this won't be the last we see of him. Another interesting thing about Cash's audio report is that he starts it by mispronouncing Ra's name. Two ceremonial swords used by Rosh. I mean, Ra's al Ghul. I think this is meant to be a fun reference to how his name is often pronounced differently by fans and media. For example, it was pronounced Raz instead of Raish in Batman Begins. 
Who are you? My name is merely Ducard, but I speak for Raz Al Ghul, a man greatly feared by the criminal underworld. We also get a couple references to the Arkham Origins game, developed by WB Montreal, confirming that Rocksteady does indeed consider it to be canon to their story. First is a case containing the shot gloves used by the Electrocutioner, one of the assassins sent after Batman. At a certain part in that story, Batman will actually use these for himself in combat, but the general consensus shared by myself and many other fans was that the shot gloves were a bit too overpowered, which is likely why they've been sitting here in evidence lockup ever since. There's also a case for Anarchy, who we apprehended during the events of Origins and never saw again. I've seen rumors online where people believe that Anarchy was actually the person who set off the scarecrow gas in the diner, since we can see an A carved into the table, similar to Anarchy's logo. The symbols do look pretty similar, so it's a theory that I like, especially since the guy is dressed in red, and kicking off such a chaotic event sounds right up Anarchy's alley. However, I haven't found any information to confirm that it's him, so it could just be a random scarecrow thug. I should mention that there's also a similar theory that the attacker was the Arkham Knight, but I find this one to be less likely, since the news report after the attack seems to suggest that the attacker died during this incident. Still, I'd be curious to hear what you all think. Continuing through the evidence lockup, we get another reference to the story of Arkham Origins when we view the case for Black Mask, aka Roman Sionis. In Cash's audio notes, he states that Sionis never really recovered from the night of the Blackgate riots, the same night Joker showed up. That's due to Joker pretty much showing up and taking Sionis' operation for himself during that game. In the center is a display case for Batman, containing his electric charge gun that he built in Arkham City. Cash states that Batman dropped it off here with the rest of the Arkham City evidence, which is surprising. I guess he thought he wouldn't have a use for it. Things have changed though, and we can break the glass to reclaim it. Although I bet we could have just asked nicely. The last case that I want to mention is for Talia Al Ghul, Bruce's love interest in Arkham City, who died by the hand of the Joker. When we get to inspect her evidence case, Bruce takes a moment to mourn. I'm sorry. As we continue apprehending villains, we'll see more evidence show up in the GCPD, so we'll come back here a bit later, but there are a couple other interesting things here that I'd like to point out first. For instance, we can see Officer Aaron Cash's family photo, which has changed a bit since we saw it in Arkham Asylum, since it appears Cash has had another child in that span of time. There's also a shift list, featuring three names of noteworthy characters not seen in this game. The first is Renee Montoya, who like Harley Quinn, was created for Batman the Animated Series, although she appeared in the comics slightly ahead of her TV debut. She's often partnered with Harvey Bullock, who's next on the list. We've actually seen Harvey once in the Arkham series, during the events of Batman Arkham Origins. He didn't make a ton of appearances in that game, but it was still fun to see him show up. The last name is a fun one, and that's John Jones. I believe this is a reference to Martian Manhunter, an alien member of the Justice League with the ability to shapeshift. In the comics, he shapeshifts into human form and goes by the name John Jones, working as a police detective. So although we never see Martian Manhunter in this game, you never know if he could be any one of these police officers. As we exit the police station, we find two officers discussing another officer in a cell. In the cell is Officer Owens, who we played as in the diner. If you didn't shoot anyone in the diner, the two officers will mention that they're surprised he was able to leave without shooting anyone. They also mention that the fear toxin doesn't seem to be wearing off, as we can see that Officer Owens is still very much in distress. However, the toxin does eventually wear off, and we can find him later in the game. He mentions that he'll be going through Psyche Val for a while, and that he hopes he can get back on the street soon and resume being a cop like normal. On the flip side, if you do shoot people in the diner, things are a bit different. The two officers state that he's going to lose his badge, and that he won't be able to live with himself when he finds out what he did. When we see him later in the game, he mentions that he's got a court hearing coming up regarding the diner, and that his career is probably over. Owens is quite the tragic character, as we further learn in one of the character files. It describes Owens' life leading up to the diner, and we find out that he was originally living in Keystone, a location often associated with the original Flash, Jay Garrick, and third Flash, Wally West. Owens hated Keystone, so he took a promotion and transferred to Gotham City, which put a strain on his marriage. His wife wanted them to move back, but Owens asked her to just stick it out for another year and see what happens. It seems his wife was right, especially in the continuity where he shoots people in the diner. So I have a feeling he's going to be moving back to Keystone after all this. Also in the GCPD is a familiar face, Jack Ryder, the news reporter we saved multiple times in Arkham City. Most notably when Deadshot attempted to assassinate him and we intervened. Jack has been busy since then, twisting those events to make himself out to be the hero. At one point, we can find a magazine with his face on the cover, along with the caption, How I Took Down Deadshot. We can actually read a section of it in the back computer, and it's pretty humorous. Are you ready, Jack? Batman asked, looking straight at me, one eye filled with admiration, the other with respect. 
I'm ready, Batman, I replied bravely. Then let's do this, Jack. Together, Batman said, asked, really. The Dark Knight stood up from behind our cover then, as we prepared to take on the deadly assassin Deadshot together. Was I afraid? Dear reader, I was terrified, but I couldn't let it show. Batman needed me. Then I saw it, the laser sight playing like a lover's tongue across his nipple. Batman, no! I shouted dramatically. I dived forward then, knocking the Cape Crusader to the ground as the bullet whizzed past my ear. Batman was back on his feet in an instant, however. He grabbed me and pulled us both into cover behind a chimney chute in the bombed ruin of Arkham City. What now, Jack? Batman asked, his voice cracking slightly under the strain. I thought for a moment. You need to hide behind cover whenever he's looking in our direction, Batman, I explained patiently, and then try and reach the vent under the helipad. Batman looked at the distance between him and the sharpshooter marksman. You can do it, Batman, I said reassuringly. I know you can. Jack also managed to get himself into trouble with the citizens of Gotham, as we can read in one of his articles. Apparently, after Arkham City, he was the one who gave evidence of Arkham City's illegal actions, showing how prisoners were being treated, and stated that anyone who was exposed to that should be released and generously compensated. However, Jack was only trying to help himself, and didn't care about the other prisoners. The result, however, was that everyone involved in Arkham City was released and compensated, putting criminals back on the street, something a lot of citizens blame him for. It's no surprise that Ryder's self-serving actions have gotten him into trouble, and that seems to be an ongoing pattern even now. Ryder has decided to not evacuate the city, and instead chase a story involving a criminal named Deacon Blackfire, and we'll see how this plot unfolds later on when we talk about the game's various side missions. As we start to exit the GCPD, there's another fun inclusion, and it's the criminal whose arm we broke earlier in the game. Throughout the story, he'll taunt us from the bars, and it's super annoying. If you've had enough of it, you can choose to slam his head into the bars, and it's immensely satisfying. After leaving the GCPD, we next head to the Clock Tower which seconds as Oracle's base of operations. She isn't here yet, so we have a moment to snoop around. On the wall is a poster for the movie The Dark Interlude, and it stars Matthew Hagen and Stella Bates. Matt Hagen is another actor who becomes Clayface, and the quote on the poster gives a nod to that with its phrasing, Hagen forms and molds into his defining role. This poster itself is a nod to the animated series, where Hagen was working on the film The Dark Interlude, while Stella Bates was a medical consultant for it, and the two ended up falling in love with each other. The quote on the poster, she cured more than his body, she cured his heart, is a quote from the movie in the show. You cured more than my body, you cured my heart. Oracle has another poster on the wall, this time for The Ghost in Grey. This is another nod to the animated series, and one of my favorite episodes from it. In it, The Ghost in Grey was a TV series that Bruce Wayne grew up watching. He idolized the hero of the show, the Grey Ghost, played by Simon Trent, whose name we can see at the bottom of the poster. A fun easter egg within the show itself is that Simon Trent was voiced by Adam West, the actor who played Batman in the 60s TV show. Pay up or pay the consequences. One million in cash or the Piedmont Bank is next. Sign the Mad Bomber. There's a nice theme of heroes inspiring a new generation, and I think Bruce's admiration for the Grey Ghost mirrors our admiration towards Batman, as many of us grew up watching various forms of Batman media, which for me personally, was Batman the Animated Series. After the tragic death of Kevin Conroy, I think this episode takes on an even more sentimental feeling, making it an episode that I think will resonate with fans that grew up on Kevin Conroy's Batman. It's a really well-made episode that I recommend you check out, and I was really glad that it got a nod in this game. You know, as a kid, I used to watch it with my father. The Grey Ghost was my hero. Really? And he still is. On a shelf, we can find a picture of Barbara and her boyfriend, who just so happens to be Tim Drake, the third and current Robin. This is a bit different from the comics, since it's usually her and Nightwing who are in a relationship. Next to that is a bust of Shakespeare, which we can interact with. Using it reveals a scanner, which transitions the clock tower into a mini Batcave. This scanner is an easter egg for the Adam West Batman series, where they used the same bust as a secret button to reveal the entrance to the Batcave. When you eventually get the remote hacking device gadget, you can also unlock a door in the clock tower which reveals Oracle's old Batgirl suit. If you're unfamiliar, Barbara Gordon was Batgirl before she was ever Oracle. She was forced to become Oracle during the events of the Killing Joke graphic novel, where Joker shot her in the spine as a way to get to her dad, Commissioner Gordon. This left her crippled, but she's kept the mementos of that past life in this room, including some newspapers mentioning her. One of them refers to a time when she rescued Commissioner Gordon, a tease at her DLC story in this game, which we'll discuss later in the video. For now though, Batman uses Oracle's computer to review her progress on analyzing Scarecrow's new toxin. This is also when Barbara arrives, and this is the first time we've actually seen Oracle in a Rock City game, despite her being fully voiced in each one. 
Working together though, they realize that they can pinpoint Scarecrow's location by targeting the energy signature of the area where the fear toxin is being produced. Batman starts to leave before Oracle stops him. She expresses guilt in lying to her dad about her evacuation, but Batman brushes it off and stays mission focused, stating that they'll find Scarecrow. From here, Batman needs to power a generator to give him access to his antenna. It's up on a rooftop, so Batman uses the Batmobile's power winch to climb up the wall. Every time I do this, it makes me think of the Batmobile driving up the wall in Batman Forever, where he uses a cable as well. After powering up the first generator though, Batman calls Oracle to inform her that they have access to the antenna. During this conversation, Robin pops in and asks Batman to let him help out in the city. Batman refuses, telling him that what he's working on is more important, and we'll find out what that is shortly. For now, we next have to gain access to a microwave tower to help us triangulate Scarecrow's location. When we arrive, we find that there are enemies inside with a hostage. Batman will need to take them out quickly, but he feels that the current Batsuit is a bit too weighty to accomplish the task, so he decides now is a good time to have Lucius Fox deploy the new Batsuit. Up until now, we've been wearing a Batsuit that looks more in line with the previous game's outfits, which are inspired more by the comics. This new suit, as we discussed, is more modernized and made to mirror the appearance of the Batmobile. It has practical uses as well though, since it's durable, but it's also more lightweight, allowing Batman to move faster. This immediately impacts your traversal, as you're allowed to propel yourself higher into the sky and pick up more momentum. It makes grappling and gliding around the city much faster, and I like that you get this boost after putting on the new suit. We've been told the suit was better and more lightweight, but now we get to experience it, which is much more impactful for the player. You can further upgrade your grapnel boost as well, and it makes traversal more fun each time you do. Along with the grapnel boost is also an ejector seat in the Batmobile, which is a lot of fun to use as well, since you can be going full speed in the Batmobile and then launch yourself into the sky. I love this inclusion, and it makes transitioning between the Batmobile and gliding feel seamless and ultimately more enjoyable. This also unlocks one of my favorite new abilities in the game, Fear Takedowns. Since Batman can move much faster now, he can quickly take down a chain of unsuspecting enemies. I think it adds a lot to the Predator stealth system, since it allows you to strategize further by attempting to keep a group of enemies together for one takedown. Also, it's just really awesome with a variety of great animations that make Batman feel like even more of an intimidating force beyond what he was before. But after quickly taking out all three of the enemies in the room, we're able to rescue the hostage and gain access to the tower. Using the tower, we're able to pinpoint where Scarecrow is manufacturing his toxin, which is at Ace Chemicals, so we head there next. Soon after, we arrive at the bridge to Ace Chemicals, where Gordon is waiting to meet us. He informs us that the chemical plant is on lockdown, but a skeleton crew of workers are still inside. Before anyone can head in though, a militia helicopter manned by a mysterious new character appears and blows the bridge. Batman shows no fear and approaches the helicopter. We get a look inside the cockpit as we're given a minor introduction to the Arkham Knight, one of the main antagonists of the game. The Arkham Knight fully intends on launching a missile at Batman, but it's jammed by Scarecrow, since he has bigger plans for Batman's demise. The Arkham Knight withdraws, and Batman is curious to find out who this new foe is. With the bridge blown, we'll have to go in alone on foot, so we grapple up high and scope things out. First things first, we need to find the Ace Chemical Workers and see what they know about Scarecrow's plan. We identify five workers in the area, so we track them down one by one. Unfortunately, the first one we find is already dead, so things look grim for the rest of them. Batman finds the gate switch though, opening up access to Ace Chemicals again. The bridge is still blown, restricting access to the police, but Batman is able to improvise and get the Batmobile inside. Using the Batmobile, we're able to gain access to the next hostage who's thankfully still alive. When we go to rescue him though, we're interrupted by the militia and this time, given a proper introduction to the Arkham Knight. We also get a better look at his design, which appears more like a militarized version of Batman, which I think is pretty cool. He also takes a moment to give his men some tips on how to properly take us down, and he knows a surprising amount about Batman's suit, like which areas are the strongest and which are the weakest, specifically that the armor is strongest near the bat symbol. I also want to credit the voice acting and motion capture work for the Arkham Knight in this scene, because right off the bat we get the sense that he's emotionally charged to defeat Batman, that he's not just some mercenary, that this is personal. I'll save the reveal for when it happens naturally in the game, but I know one criticism about it is that fans felt it was too easy to guess who was under the mask. Regardless of whether you guess it early or not, I do like these little conversations between Bruce and the Arkham Knight, and the little clues they give towards his identity. The Arkham Knight was sloppy though, and forgot that the Batmobile was right behind them, and Batman is able to seize the opportunity and take the militia soldiers out, while the Arkham Knight escapes. After taking out all the guards, we release the captured Ace Chemicals worker. He informs us that things have been pretty bad here, and that Scarecrow is building a fear gas bomb that could cover the entire East Coast. We'll need to act fast to stop him, so we make our way deeper into the chemical plant. After breaking in, we find another dead chemical worker, as well as an easter egg back to Arkham Origins. On a table, we can find a vial labeled Copperhead Poison. 
This is a nod back to the villain Copperhead, who we fought back in Arkham Origins. Batman experienced the effects of her poison momentarily in that game, and it caused him to have hallucinations similar to the ones he's experienced after being exposed to Scarecrow's fear toxin. So this poison being in the chemical plant could mean that Scarecrow was experimenting with it as a potential inclusion to his fear toxin. Continuing on though, we eventually find another chemical worker who isn't dead. We rescue him from the militia, and he tells us what he knows. It's not good news though, as he informs us that Scarecrow is in the central mixing chamber, prepping to release his bomb. We continue further into the plant, and come across a group of militia guards strategizing about how to successfully carry out Scarecrow's plan. We'll drop in and interrupt it, and this is one of my favorite early fight scenes in the game for a couple reasons. The first is that we're given a larger number of enemies to fight at once, and I think large volumes of enemies showcase just how good the combat system is in this game. More enemies usually means the fight is more frantic, making it feel more fast-paced as you attempt to juggle them all. I also like this fight in particular because it gives you a lot of options for environment takedowns, another new element to the combat. Around the map there will be objects highlighted in blue, and if a nearby enemy is also highlighted in blue, it means you can instantly take them out with that object. In this case, you can cut a light fixture down and have it land on their head, you can smash their face into an electrical box, or you can grab a ventilation box from the wall and launch it at an enemy. I loved using these, and anytime I can interact with something in the room during combat, it always adds to the immersion and makes the environment feel more realistic. So this fight is easily one of my favorites from the early game. Once you're done defeating all these enemies, you can also find an easter egg in the next room. On one of the lockers we can find the name Ray Palmer, with a large drawing of an atom, referencing the DC hero by the same name, the Atom. He's a character with shrinking powers similar to Marvel's Ant-Man, and he's been a member of the Justice League. Continuing on though, we next find Scarecrow in the control room of the central mixing chamber. His men are still loading more of his compound, so we sneak around the room and take them out. Afterward, we confront Scarecrow ourselves. He's even creepier and more ghoulish looking now that we see him in person, but he's in no shape to fight. He instantly gives himself up, but Batman has no time for mercy. How do I shut it down? Let me go, or she dies. What are you talking about? Barbara Gordon. Have you found him? Get out of there, now! Relax. No one knows I'm here. Nothing hurts like losing one of the family. Knowing that there is no one to blame but yourself. Scarecrow's last line about losing someone you love is something Batman is too familiar with, most notably with his parents, Thomas and Martha Wayne, as well as second Robin, Jason Todd, who was murdered by the Joker. Batman doesn't intend on letting anyone else die, so instead of chasing down Scarecrow, he plans to stay in the room and reduce the blast radius of the bomb while Alfred works on tracking down Barbara. Alfred doesn't like this plan though, because it means that Bruce will be trapped in the blast and likely die. Bruce knows this too, and it becomes an incredibly tense moment in the game. Still, Bruce is determined to stay and reduce the blast, so our next task is to pull neutralizing agent containers out of their chamber and place them in the proper area. The issue is that the neutralizing agent is incredibly unstable, so you have to perform these actions very slowly. I thought this was a brilliant way to up the tension of this moment, because you're forced to move in a very calm and slow manner, while bombs explode around you and sirens are going off. The atmosphere around you is telling you to rush, while the game forces you to move slow. As you progress, the music becomes sadder, as Alfred begs you to stop what you're doing and escape the building. They both know this is goodbye, and the sadness mixed with the tension always manages to hit me emotionally, where I become immersed in the moment and feel for the characters. After pulling out the fourth canister of neutralizing agent though, the moment makes a sharp transition. Miss me? Before we get to digest what exactly just happened, we're transitioned into a flashback. We're now playing as Commissioner Gordon for technically the second time in this game. Earlier, Gordon mentioned that he was the one who pushed the button to cremate Joker, which we also did, so I think we were secretly playing as him in that moment. But now though, we actually get to walk around as Gordon as he arrives at the Panessa Movie Studios. It's stated in the game that the Panessas were a crime family that used the movie studios as a front to launder money, while also making the occasional low-budget film. Unlike the Moroni and Falcone crime families, the Panessas didn't last in Gotham once Batman arrived, and the studio went under. Bruce Wayne has since bought the property as part of his Wayne regeneration project to revamp Gotham, and it's stated that he plans to turn it into an amusement park. In the meantime though, he has other uses for it as Batman, which is why he summoned Gordon. 
Before entering, we can walk around a bit, and it's cool to see Gotham in the daytime, something I don't think we've seen in any of the other games. You can also see some cars driving around that you don't see in the rest of the game, since this is prior to the evacuation. This is also when I realize Gotham is home to some pretty terrible drivers, and they don't seem to be able to handle this intersection well. Once inside the studio, we immediately enter an elevator. On the walls are some more posters, one of which is the Flying Graysons at Haley's Circus. Prior to becoming Robin and then Nightwing, Dick Grayson and his parents were the Flying Graysons and performed in the circus. Sadly, both his parents were killed during one of their shows as an extortion act against the circus. This left Dick an orphan, and he was later adopted by Bruce Wayne. Interestingly, we get another nod to the Flying Graysons on Barbara Gordon's character model. She has a necklace with the initials FG and a circus backdrop. This could just be a simple gift from Nightwing, or it could be a nod towards their relationship in the comics, since it's usually Barbara and Dick who are dating, not Barbara and Tim. As we go further into the studio, we can see more posters, this one advertising the Terror, starring Basil Carlo. If this looks familiar, it's because Basil Carlo is the clayface we fought in Arkham City, and the Terror was the movie that was advertised and playing at the Monarch Theater during that fight. There's also the poster for Other Fish to Fry, starring Basil Carlo and Paul Sloan. Like Carlo, Paul Sloan was an actor turned murderer. In the comics, Paul Sloan was a method actor who liked to dive deep into his roles. This got him into trouble though, when he was asked to portray the villain Two-Face by other members of Batman's rogues gallery. For some background, a bunch of Batman's villains decided they should team up to take down the Bat for good, and the plan hinged on the cooperation of Two-Face, since he and Batman used to be allies. Two-Face flipped his coin to decide if he should help, and the result is that he wouldn't help the other villains. With no other options, the villains invited Paul Sloan to act as Two-Face. Sloan took the role too far though, tailing Two-Face to study him, and eventually becoming so fixated on the role that he decided he should pull off a heist as Two-Face. Two-Face doesn't like being impersonated, so he tracked down Sloan and scarred his face. Sloan was believed to be dead after this, but later returned to kill all the villains who set him down this path, but he only successfully killed someone pretending to be Killer Moth, so some nice irony there. In the next room though, Gordon is shocked to discover five holding cells with four people in them. These prisoners are the missing people that were hinted at in the diner, the first of which is Johnny Charisma, the missing performer, and we can see he's looking very jokerized. That will be a common theme, as we next look at the Goliath, a heavyweight boxer who's been assaulting random people. Next is Christina Bell, the woman who murdered the board members of Queen Industries. Lastly is school principal Henry Adams, who surprisingly doesn't seem to be suffering the same violent tendencies as the others, and seems normal. Batman then shows up and explains what's going on. It all goes back to Arkham City, where Joker sent his infected blood to hospitals in Gotham. Gordon and Batman thought they recovered it all, but due to some hospital errors, these four people still managed to get infected. Over time, the Joker's blood has started to infect them and turn them into him. To try and ground this in reality more, Batman states that this disease is a form of kreutzfeldt jakob disease, which is a real thing, although it feels like a pretty loose tie to this Joker disease. From what I could find about kreutzfeldt jakob disease, it's a rare degenerative brain disorder that rapidly leads to dementia. A couple of the symptoms are memory loss and personality changes, which I assume is what Rocksteady was focusing on here, but to a grander scale. I think the idea is that as the brain deteriorates and you start to lose more of your memory and your core personality, the Joker infection starts to fill in those gaps and take control, turning you more into him, but that's just my speculation. However, we'll also later see that a lot of the Joker infection has to do with your will to resist it or succumb to it. There's also the case of Henry Adams, who is showing no symptoms. Due to this, Batman believes that Henry is the answer to the cure, so he's tasked Robin with running tests to try to find the solution, but so far they've come up short. Gordon also notices that there are five cells but only four prisoners, to which Batman states the fifth will be here soon, with a good shot of Batman's reflection in the empty cell. This suggests that Batman is the final prisoner, and that the cure he took in Arkham City didn't actually fully cure him like we thought. This transitions us back to present day, as Joker is the one who wakes us. Now that we know that Batman is the fifth victim of Joker's blood, we know that Joker is just a figment of his mind, as the Joker's infection attempts to take over. As far as how I feel about this reveal, I'm glad to see Joker return, especially since he's still voiced by Mark Hamill, and it's fun to have Joker haunting Batman from the grave. That said, I'm glad Joker is still legitimately dead though, since I don't want him to overshadow Scarecrow, who needs to remain the main antagonist, or else we'll have another Arkham Origins scenario. So overall, I'm enjoying this twist and the flavor it adds to the story and gameplay. Looking back at the opening scene of Joker's cremation, knowing now that Joker would make a return, the music choice in that section makes a lot more sense. During the cremation montage, the song I've Got You Under My Skin by Frank Sinatra plays throughout it. I think Sinatra intended for the lyrics to reference a forbidden romance, but the words also apply to Bruce's new case of Jokeritis, even if we just look at the first few lines. 
I've got you under my skin. I've got you deep in the heart of me. So deep in my heart that you're really a part of me, I've got you under my skin. With Joker now deep in Bruce's subconscious, I think this was a really clever song choice. Rocksteady have even more fun with this moment if you start up New Game Plus. When you choose to burn Joker, this time he'll pop out at you. But now that we're awake, we get another opportunity to explore the room. On the ground, we can actually find Scarecrow's original mask from Arkham Asylum, although it's strange that it's here considering we already found it on a bridge in Arkham City. I guess Scarecrow reclaimed it or had a spare. Regardless, I think this is meant to symbolize that Scarecrow has ditched this version of himself and that he now has a new face and intends to bring a new level of fear to Gotham. We can also see that Batman failed to place the final neutralizing agent into its holder, so there's still a 25% blast radius that's active. The Joker hallucination persuades Batman to escape like Alfred suggested, so we'll next use the Batmobile to race out of Ace Chemicals before it explodes. Luckily, the remaining blast radius seems to have been contained to the Ace Chemicals plant, so the rest of Gotham and the East Coast has been spared, at least for now. With that taken care of, we return back to the GCPD to break the news to Gordon that his daughter is actually still in Gotham and has been taken by Scarecrow. As you'd expect, our Joker hallucination loves this. When Wait to see the look on his face when you tell him his daughter's been kidnapped! <laughs> and it's all your fault! <laughs> this is going to be classic! When Batman tells him that Barbara's been taken, he conveniently leaves out the part about her being Oracle. Gordon is furious at Scarecrow, though, and wants to go to the clock tower to search for clues to her whereabouts. So we escort Gordon back to the clock tower, but tell him to wait in the car while we search the place. When we drop into the clock tower, we land in another hallucination, this time it's a memory of Joker's. Barbara is alone in her apartment when she hears a knock at the door. When she answers, it's Joker who shoots her in the spine, crippling her. He then proceeds to take pictures of her, and it's a pretty horrific scene. Believe it or not, this is actually a pretty tame recreation of the graphic novel that it's taken from, titled The Killing Joke. In that story, Joker does the same thing, but after shooting her, he strips her naked and takes pictures of her. Joker's goal in that story is to prove to Batman that all it takes is one bad day to break a man and turn him bad. He aims to prove this through Gordon by providing him the worst day of his life. So this attack on Barbara is a big part of that plan to break him. He would later strip Gordon down as well and trap him on a coaster that carries him through a montage of the photos he took of Barbara. Joker actually references this moment earlier if you wait around at Gordon's police car before talking to him straight away. Reminds me of the time I had something to tell old Jimbo myself. Now on that occasion, I found visual aids helpful. <sighs> that was a bad day. <laughs> Fun though! Once we break free from the hallucination, we're back in the clock tower and can resume our investigation. All we find is her wheelchair though, as Gordon arrives. Batman decides that the best thing to do is reveal the truth to him, so he transitions the clock tower into Oracle's base again. I think it was good that Batman finally told him, but the consequence is that Gordon is pissed off to an extreme degree. This is all your fault. I will find her. She's my family! My daughter! She's all I've got! Gordon then throws his bat phone on the ground and states that he'll find Barbara on his own. It's a sad moment, but Barbara is still a priority, so Batman immediately begins his search. Batman hacks into the city's security cameras to see if they captured the kidnapping. We're given four cameras to look through, and we can scrub through them to find the necessary information that we need. There's also a fun detail if you go to the end of the footage in the first camera, where you can see Victor Zaz randomly step into view. We don't encounter him anywhere else in the game, but we do get teases that he's active. While you're exploring Gotham, you can come across three of his victims who have been murdered and posed. In the back computer, we learn that Zaz was excluded from Scarecrow's plans, so he's killing Two-Face and Penguin's men for revenge until Batman defeats Scarecrow, at which point he plans on killing Batman himself. As we analyze the footage on the second camera, we see that Arkham Knight was the one who took Barbara and drove off with her. Batman is able to analyze the vehicle type and determine its tire tread, which gives him the ability to follow the trail. At the end of the trail, we find the Knight's vehicle crashed with nobody around, so Batman sets up a crime scene. Batman's detective vision is able to recreate the scene to help us determine what exactly happened here. After analyzing the evidence, we can determine that Barbara managed to spray the driver with pepper spray, causing him to crash. Barbara was able to exit the vehicle and crawl away, and toss something under a crate for us to find before she was recaptured by the Arkham Knight. 
When we look under the crate, we find a memory chip, which will help us pinpoint the Arkham Knight's location. Batman sends this info over to Lucius Fox at Wayne Enterprises so he can decrypt it, and we'll head there next to see what he finds. If you're unfamiliar with him, Lucius Fox is the current CEO of Wayne Enterprises and one of the few people who know Bruce Wayne as Batman. Lucius runs Wayne Enterprises for Bruce, but he's also a skilled inventor and makes many of Batman's gadgets for him. We can actually find one of those new gadgets earlier than he planned if you go to the Shakespeare head in the office, which reveals a container of Batman's equipment. Inside is a new and improved disruptor, and Lucius says he'll have it ready later. There are some other cool details that you can find in the office as well, like the portrait of Bruce and his parents. This actually used to be Thomas Wayne's office back when he was alive and running Wayne Industries, so I imagine this was a portrait he had hanging up back then that Bruce chose to leave up. Probably the most fun easter eggs that you can find here are in Bruce's answering machine. The first voicemail is from Vicki Vale, the reporter we saved during Arkham City, and it seems they have a relationship now, although I doubt it's a serious one. Bruce? It's Vicki. Are you there? I know you're listening to these messages. Look, if it's about that article, blame Ryder. I had nothing to do with it, I swear. Call me, okay? I miss you, Brucey. Brucey? The next message is from Cassie. Bruce, it's Cassie. You do remember me, right? <laughs> um, listen, I had, like, so much fun the other night. You were nothing like what I read in the papers. Anyway, call me when you get this. I got a couple of cute friends who are dying to meet you. This is likely Cassandra Kane, daughter of assassins David Kane and Lady Shiva, who I talk about more in my Arkham Origins video. Cassandra would eventually take up the mantle of Batgirl in the comics as well. In the next voicemail, we actually hear from Lex Luthor, who's attempting to buy Wayne's Applied Sciences division. Mr. Wayne, Lex Luthor calling. Apologies for going via your direct line, but I grow tired of these games. LexCorp has made a very generous offer for Wayne Tech's Applied Sciences Division, yet your persistent unavailability begins to look less like a busy schedule and more like deliberately antagonistic behavior. Come now, meet with me. I'm sure we can come to an agreement. A man of your refined taste doesn't need an Applied Sciences Division after all. He needs another billion dollars. Lex Luthor is the owner of LexCorp in Metropolis, and a common antagonist to Superman. Bruce's final voicemail is from Kate Kane. Bruce, it's Kate. You're coming to Maggie and I's engagement thing next week, aren't you? No one's seen you in months, Bruce. And you taught me the importance of keeping up appearances. Kate Kane is Batwoman, and the Maggie she's referring to is Maggie Sawyer, who she has a relationship with. So some pretty cool easter eggs in these voicemails, but... Oh, wait, there's actually more. Also in the room is a food bowl with the name Ace. This is a reference to Ace the Bat Hound. After exploring the office though, we use the chip Oracle gave us to scan for the Arkham Knight's voice print. The scan is successful and pinpoints his location in the tunnels, so we head there next. As we enter the tunnel network, we can find a toy called the Ghost Train. This is a ride in Gotham that occasionally shows up in the comics, and it's also the ride that Joker puts Gordon on in The Killing Joke. It's also a callback to Arkham City, where the Ghost Train shows up as well. While in the tunnels, we also get a call from Robin, stating that he hasn't heard from Barbara in a while and he's wondering if she's okay. Batman actually chooses to lie to him here, and tells him that she's just working on something for him, and that Robin should stay focused on the cure. It's pretty cold that Batman didn't tell Robin the truth, but he's really paranoid about what could happen if they don't find a cure for Joker's infection, so he needs Tim focused. I think Bruce also lied to Tim because of what just happened after he told the truth to Gordon. At this moment, he thinks he lost a friend and an ally at a crucial moment, and I think he's scared that the same could happen with Robin. Regardless, Batman needs to focus on finding the Arkham Knight, which might be easier than expected since he gets the drop on us as we infiltrate the tunnels. He takes a moment to show off his in-depth knowledge about our suit once again by shooting a bullet where there's minimal armor. He then walks off and leaves his men to deal with us. This leads to a pretty cool combat section where we're introduced to Brutes, giant armored militia henchmen who are tougher to take down. 
Along with them, ninjas are thrown into the fray, as well as plenty of standard enemies. I thought this was another fun combat encounter with some good enemy variety and environmental takedowns, and so far, I'm enjoying the challenge progression of the combat as the story goes on. After taking them all out though, we continue our hunt for the Arkham Knight and Barbara. Batman is able to track his voice print again and locate the vehicle he's driving in, so we pursue him through the streets of Gotham and launch missiles at him to subdue him. Eventually, we're able to disable the vehicle, so we get out to confront the Knight. Annoyingly, it's not him, just some random militia thug wearing a voice changer. The Arkham Knight must have caught onto our plan and tricked us into chasing the wrong man. With no other options, we're forced to interrogate the driver on the Knight's location. Batman's method for doing so is to back the Batmobile's tire onto his head and apply pressure until he talks. By the way, this is cited by the ESRB as a moment that played a factor in their M rating. It's not that bad though, because you can't actually crush the guy's head. Believe me, I tried, and you'll just endlessly rev the Batmobile until you finally release the pressure. This tactic is successful though, and the driver ends up talking. He tells us that the Arkham Knight has gone to meet the Penguin, who supplied some safe houses for the militia. He also tells us that we can find Penguin through his front company called North Refrigeration, which he uses to distribute weapons through the city. The name North Refrigeration is likely a reference to the voice actor Nolan North, who voices the Penguin. When we talk to Alfred about North Refrigeration, he gets us in touch with Nightwing, who's coincidentally been tracking them too, and has already scoped out their location. For some background, Dick Grayson eventually left Gotham to become his own man in Bloodhaven as Nightwing. Bloodhaven is arguably more crime-ridden than Gotham, so he has his hands full. North Refrigeration has been headquartered in Bloodhaven, so Nightwing has been tracking them for a while. Recently, he's found out that they've expanded their operation into Gotham, so Nightwing has since returned to Gotham and wants to help us shut down Penguin for good. It's exciting to finally see Nightwing appear in the story of an Arkham game, and this is the first time he's been voiced in the series. Batman isn't as excited to see him though, and tells him to go back to Bloodhaven while he handles this. Nightwing reluctantly agrees, but not before handing off that new disruptor that Lucius made for us, which now has the ability to track vehicles. I actually really love the disruptor, and it always makes me think of the gun that Bruce uses in the Dark Knight movie to fire remote explosives. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if it was based off of that. Our goal here though is to use the disruptor to place a tracker on the vehicle and then scare the henchmen into driving off, in hopes that they'll lead us to one of Penguin's stash houses. What did you forget? No, no, no! It's Batman! Get the hell out of here! Subtlety works. With the tracker placed, we'll tail them from a distance, high on the rooftops. I absolutely love this mission, because it felt so cool and Batman-like to stalk enemies this way. As planned, they head back to their hideout, giving us the opportunity to crash the party. Sure enough, once we're inside, we can see the Penguin is here too. We'll sneak up from behind him and interrogate him on the location of Barbara. He tells us that Scarecrow has gone to see Simon Stagg, the owner of Stagg Enterprises, which is currently housed in an airship above Gotham. Penguin's men then grab Batman, and Penguin is able to escape. Thankfully, Nightwing didn't take our advice to leave Gotham, and instead shows up to lend a hand. This leads to a combat sequence that introduces us to another new gameplay mechanic, and that's team combat encounters. We can fight alongside Nightwing, and switch to him whenever we want, as well as trigger team takedowns where Batman and Nightwing cooperatively attack an enemy. I think this was a brilliant inclusion to the gameplay, and adds a whole new layer to the combat. Plus, it's nice getting to fight as other members of the Bat family. After taking them all out, we need to destroy all the weapons contained in the vault. So Batman sprays explosive gel in there and exits to blow it up. This is also where we get a great example of how much fun Rocksteady is having with their inclusion of Joker, as he reacts to Batman's actions. Please! What are you doing? Bat! Come on! Don't lock me in here! I'll do anything! You want your laundry done? I'll do it! Help out, Alfred! You got it! I wouldn't like to be that guy! From here, we'll leave Nightwing to track down more Penguin stashes, which we'll discuss more when we get to the side missions. Next, we head to Stag's airship to see if Penguin's intel was useful. To help us break in, we return to Wayne Tower and retrieve the remote hacking device. We'll then just glide right over the airships and hack our way in. Once inside, we can see that the militia have already been here and killed everyone. For what reason, Batman is not entirely sure yet. Stag Industries is a biomedical research company, and their display has voiceover that describes their new mass airborne inoculation treatment program, which allows them to deliver large quantities of medicine to hundreds of thousands of people, a technology that could be very helpful if used by the right hands. To continue further into the ship, Batman hacks the airship's controls, allowing us to tilt it. This was a pretty cool mechanic specific to this level, and it created some interesting puzzles as you tried to create pathways. 
As we progress further, we eventually find Simon Stagg, the CEO of Stagg Industries, and he's been captured by the militia. We'll drop in to help him out, and this leads to another massive brawl against a bunch of militia guards. We'll take them all out and rescue Stagg, but this is where things start to get really trippy again. After Stagg informs us that Scarecrow is on the second airship, we begin to hallucinate Joker again. Then, all the militia guards start to rise from the ground like zombies to surround us. I love the audio design here too, as the background music is very tense and foreboding, as it transitions into overwhelming laughter from the Joker. I thought this was a very effective and creepy moment, and it leads to us beating up all the Jokers in the room. Eventually, they'll get the upper hand, and you'll start to choke each other out. I wanted to see what happens if you let them choke you, and it looks like you can't die, the screen just goes infinitely black. But when you actually struggle against the Joker hallucination, you'll kick him off and return to the real world, as we learn that Stag has been recaptured. Batman's Joker problems are obviously becoming worse, and it's starting to hinder his effectiveness. We need to find Stag though, and we begin by hacking into the weapon system of the airship to destroy the security on the other ship. We're now free to glide over to the next airship and take out the henchmen that are waiting within it. Inside this ship, we'll also find containment cells of old research participants. Probably participants from flyers like the ones we saw in the diner, and we can see how things turned out for them. Along with each cell are also Simon Stagg's audio research notes, and we learn that he partnered with Scarecrow to enhance his new toxin. Scarecrow also wanted to use Stagg's Cloudburst technology, which could disperse the toxin rapidly and in a wide proximity. However, Stagg wasn't entirely pleased with this arrangement. At first, Stagg agreed to join Scarecrow because he saw potential in the toxin for things like curing depression or selling it to the military. He hoped that Scarecrow would eventually see the lucrative potential of this formula and market it, but instead he's remained solely focused on using it to defeat Batman. Since Stagg no longer saw any financial gain in the partnership, he wanted out and planned to escape. Once Scarecrow learned of this, it put them at odds, which is why he's captured Stagg. By the time we reach Stagg, there's not much we can do as Scarecrow gasses him with fear toxin. His demise here would be poetic justice, but Batman decides to knock him out and spare him from the nightmares. In the next room, we find Scarecrow working on a computer, or rather, two Scarecrows, as one is an inconveniently timed hallucination. We have to choose which one we think is the real Scarecrow and grab him, or else look like a fool and blow our opportunity. No matter which one you choose though, the game always forces you to pick the wrong one, and Scarecrow gasses you. The fear toxin elevates the Joker infection more each time we're hit with it, so there's little Batman can do to stop the Joker from taking control here. With Joker in control, it's really creepy hearing his voice and seeing him smile within Batman's body. Look at me! I'm amazing! And this body! I can't believe how strong it is! While fighting as Joker, your hits feel more aggressive and you get the sense the Joker is really enjoying beating up all these henchmen. Scarecrow notices this too as we attack him next, leading to a really interesting scene where we see how Joker is attempting to influence Batman. Come on, finish him! Finish him. Look at him! He's no better than the creep who killed your parents. You need to do something. You need to stop him. Good. Good. Something's changed. You're different. I prefer to call it a work in progress, but it does show potential. Since we hear a gunshot from this hallucination, I think we're meant to believe that Bruce did give in for a moment and willingly pulled the trigger, which is why he drops to his knees. The Joker is chipping away at him piece by piece, but he still hasn't managed to take full control just yet. In the time it took for Bruce to snap out of his internal struggle, Scarecrow managed to reach the end of the airship where he's rigged it to be yanked off as a means of escape for himself and the cloudburst. I also want to point out that I think some of this stag airship mission was slightly inspired by the Batman the Animated Series episode, Nothing to Fear. In it, Scarecrow also hijacks an airship that Batman has to break into. Scarecrow even manages to escape out the back of this one too, but this time in a little glider. So I thought those were some interesting similarities, but I digress. Shortly after this, Scarecrow makes a broadcast showing the location of Barbara Gordon, which is the same location he had Ivy contained earlier in the game. 
We rush there next and find Barbara still there. However, once we arrive, Scarecrow releases the fear gas into the chamber, causing Barbara to hallucinate while we watch. Yes, you see it now. The horror behind the glass. No. The monster that will be your end. Unless you pick up that gun and deny him. No. Don't listen! Barbara, it's me! Your friend! You won't get me! I won't let you get me! You will bring death to all who follow you. I imagine this was another scene that led to that M rating, and it's pretty effective. We'll come back to this scene later too, because there's more that I want to discuss with it. But immediately after Barbara's death, Batman breaks the news to Alfred that she's dead, and it seems that this has gone a long way towards breaking Batman mentally, the way Scarecrow planned. As emotional as Bruce is right now, Alfred is able to talk him back up, stating that he's learned that the Cloudburst is a dispersal device, and if it becomes operational, Scarecrow will cover the entire city in fear gas. This gives him the idea that he should return back to Poison Ivy, since she was immune to Scarecrow's toxin. So we head back to the GCPD to talk with Ivy. She's resistant to helping us at first, but when she learns that all her plants will die if she doesn't, she agrees to help. In order to counteract Scarecrow's toxin though, she needs to awaken some ancient roots beneath Gotham, so we load her into the Batmobile and get to work. We'll start by taking Ivy to the Botanical Gardens, where she uses one of her plants as a command center, while we locate the roots of another. Once we find its location, we use the Batmobile to trigger a sonar blast, which awakens the ancient root and allows Ivy to control it. With Ivy on our side, we're in a better position to go on the offensive against Scarecrow and the Arkham Knight, so Batman heads back to Panessa Movie Studios to use the Batcomputer for further analysis of the Knight's forces. This also means that we'll have to come in contact with Robin though, who still doesn't know that his girlfriend Barbara is dead, let alone missing. Alfred asks Batman how he'll break the news to him, and surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, Batman says he's not going to tell him because he wants him to remain focused on the cure. Batman is always so mission-focused that it's tough to say if this coldness is a side effect of the Joker's personality eking into his mind, or if Batman would make this decision normally anyway. I personally think this is just Batman being more focused on the mission than the emotions of others, especially after seeing how Gordon reacted in the Clock Tower. Inside the studio, we can also find a Freeze Blast, like the ones Mr. Freeze gave us in Arkham City. It's a missable gadget, and like with the remote electrical charge in the GCPD, I think it's cool that we can find Batman's gadgets through exploration, and not just solely through normal story beats. But after running our analysis on the Batcomputer, Robin wants to talk with us, and Batman is given the opportunity to reveal what happened to Barbara. Still haven't heard from Barbara. Trust me, Robin. She's fine. I need you to focus on the cure. You don't have to do this on your own, Bruce. I can help you. It's under control. We need that antidote. We're getting there. It won't be long now. Look, if you need help, you know where to find me. I do feel bad for Robin. He clearly trusts Batman, but he's being kept in the dark and he's forced to work on this toxin even though he feels he can do more. He doesn't even know that Batman is suffering from the Joker infection, which I think would help motivate him to work on the cure more. Still, with Batman's life on the line, it's hard to completely argue with Bruce's decision to keep Tim in the dark so he stays focused. It's ethically wrong, but it's more likely to produce a positive outcome for the cure. Regardless, Joker is absolutely loving the drama. <laughs> I thought for sure you were going to tell him. Come clean like you did with Gordon. Ah, but you realized. Why break him now when we can crush him later? It's classic Joker. Something truly beautiful is happening, Bats. After leaving the studios, Batman next heads to the clock tower to analyze the Batwing's progress at locating the Cloudburst. It's been unsuccessful so far, and our analysis is interrupted by an emergency call back at the Panessa Movie Studios. Henry Adams is requesting our help, as we see that Harley Quinn is broken in. Batman heads back to the movie studios, and enters the elevator, where we get a fun nod back to the first game. Ah, memories. You, me, an award full of psychotic killers. <laughs> You've never felt so at home, have you? This moment is of course a nice nostalgic callback to the opening level of the first game, where Batman escorts Joker to his cell in Arkham Asylum. <laughs> what? Don't you trust me? Our guest has arrived. 
After we're done hallucinating, we join Robin as he attempts to fight off Harley's men. This is another team combat section where we can switch between Batman and Robin, and these team battles are quickly becoming some of my favorite fights in the game due to their thematics and how fresh they make the combat feel. After defeating all the thugs, Batman and Robin interrogate the only conscious henchman, and it's pretty fun seeing them interrogate someone together. How did she find us? How did she get in? I'd let him know if I were you. He's not always in such a good mood. How should I know? I guess she's smarter than you think. Not likely. With that thug being a dead end, they turn to the back computer to see what they can learn. It seems Harley was pretty much able to stroll into the movie studios, bypassing the voice recognition scanner and the various other security protocols, which is very strange. Not only that, but she's broken all the infected prisoners out, and they're hiding out in different movie sets in the studio. Our goal now is to track down each one and lock them back up, while also attempting to find Harley. Thankfully, Henry is still here, so we have him wait in this room while we hunt down the others. As we continue further into the studio, we find another movie poster, this time for Dr. Dorian's Island of Mutants. Like the Dark Interlude poster, this is a reference to another Batman the Animated Series episode. Dr. Dorian is a scientist who experiments with genetic engineering, splicing the DNA of different creatures on his private island. His most prized creation is a cat man named Tigris, and Dorian decides to follow this up by kidnapping Catwoman and turning her into a literal Catwoman. Tigris ends up falling for her, and by the time Batman arrives, it creates a bit of a love triangle between the three of them. It's definitely one of the more unique episodes in the series, but by the end of it, I was pretty captivated by the Tigris character, so maybe it's worth a watch if you're curious. Continuing on though, we'll head to our first Joker, Christina Bell, who's hidden away in the haunted house set. My understanding from the back computer files is that each infected Joker victim has started to take on specific aspects of Joker's personality, and my personal interpretation is that Christina has taken on the crazier side of Joker, as well as his attachment to Batman, both of which we can see in this interaction between Christina and Harley's men. Anything happens to her, Harley will kill you. Yeah, he's right. And if Batman sees how you've treated me, he's gonna knock out you? And you? Well, maybe not you. Definitely you. And you. Oops. <laughs> well, that evens things up a little. Anyway, when he's done with you chumps, me and Bats will have this place all to ourselves. So get out there and make him show you how much he wants me! <laughs> now that Christina has locked herself away, Batman and Robin need to take out Harley's men to get to her. We've already seen team combat sections, but now we get a team stealth section, which I think is a really fun concept. Batman and Robin are both grappling around the room, and while playing as one of them, you can call the other to drop in and perform a stealth takedown, which transitions you to that character. I had a lot of fun with this, but we'll talk about it more in the gameplay section of the video. After clearing the room though, we next confront Christina. We'll bust down the door, and she'll specifically target Robin for an attack. If you fail to counter her, she'll start slashing away at Robin with her nails, marking up his face. Batman will also criticize Robin for being too slow, and it's almost like he's criticizing you, the player, which I think is effective because it helps put you in Robin's shoes for a moment. I think she clawed half my face off. Be honest, how's it look? Like you're too slow. As a further consequence, Robin will also have slash marks on his face for the rest of the game. However, if you're quick enough, you can counter her attack and grab her before she lands a hit. Interestingly, Batman won't compliment your reflexes here, he only criticizes you if you get something wrong, which kind of gives you a glimpse at what it's like being part of the Bat family under Bruce. Robin also wonders why she targeted him specifically with such aggression, and that goes back to the Joker personality trait that she's developed. We'll learn that before his death, Joker hated the sidekicks because he felt that they interfered with his and Batman's antagonistic relationship. He misses the early days when it was just the one-on-one -on -one rivalry between them. This seems to have bled over to Christina, who now has a deep obsession for Batman and a deep hatred for Robin. From here though, Robin carries Christina back to her cell, while Batman gets a head start on the next Joker. He's stalled on the way though, when he walks into another memory of Jokers, this time the Robin he failed to save, Jason Todd. Why won't you just kill me? What? Oh, no, 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 no! I'm not going to kill you. Not yet, anyway. You're my sidekick now. Imagine it! You and me, out on the streets, starting fights, picking on the weak. 
A regular dynamic duo! Just like Bats and that new kid of his. No, oh, he wouldn't. You think? So, this isn't Batman, then? Oh, weird. The pointy ears are usually a dead giveaway. <sighs> I didn't want to show you that photo. Really, I didn't. But, well, it was the only way for you to get closure. Now, I know it hurts, but sometimes you gotta be cruel to be kind. So let's talk about Jason Todd for a moment and how he came to get to this place. In the comics, Batman randomly encountered Jason when he found him stealing the tires off the Batmobile. Jason was an orphan like Bruce and was resorting to crime to help himself survive on the streets. Batman saw that the kid was skilled but on the wrong path, so Bruce adopted him and trained him to be the next Robin. Jason was a good Robin, but he also had violent tendencies and a rebellious attitude, often disobeying Batman's orders. One day, Jason learned that his birth mother, Sheila Haywood, might actually be alive, so he and Bruce went on the hunt for her, which brought them to Ethiopia. Coincidentally, Joker just so happened to be looking for her too, because she's a doctor from Gotham with a troubled past that he could easily blackmail for medical supplies. Joker beats Batman and Robin to her, and she reluctantly agrees to help the Joker. Later, Jason is reunited with his mother, and he finally seems to be happy. However, shortly after this reunion, he notices her leaving with the Joker. He tails them to a supply depot and learns that Joker is blackmailed her, and that he's also swapped the medical boxes with ones filled with deadly laughing gas, which are about to be transported to the camp Sheila works at. Jason races over to Batman to inform him of the situation, and Batman is forced to make a choice. He decides he needs to get to the cargo truck first before saving Jason's mom. He also knows Jason isn't ready to face the Joker, so he tells him to wait here until he gets back. Jason agrees, but once Batman leaves, he decides he'll take on the Joker by himself anyway. So Jason returns back to the supply depot, where he tells his mother that he's Robin and can help her out of this situation. She tells him that the Joker is gone, and leads him deeper into the depot. At this moment, we learn that Joker is actually still there, and that Sheila has betrayed her son in hopes of saving herself. She's also been embezzling money, and she worries that if Robin apprehends Joker, then her crimes will be revealed. As if things couldn't get worse for Jason, Joker then proceeds to beat him close to death with a crowbar. Sheila also learns that her cold-hearted betrayal was pointless, as the Joker ties her up and sets a bomb to explode. Jason regains consciousness and tries to help his mother escape, but they run out of time and the bomb explodes. What happens next was actually left up to the readers, as we can see on this original ad. Readers were given the power to decide the fate of Jason Todd, and could call in to cast their vote. Grimly, readers ultimately decided that Jason should die, which leads to this iconic image of Batman holding Jason's dead body. DC later revealed the alternate panel that was drawn had readers chosen to keep Jason alive, and it's pretty interesting to think how Jason's story could have played out had he been kept alive. As far as what happens after Jason's death, things get pretty wacky, as at the end of that same issue, we next see the Joker as the Iranian ambassador to the UN, which grants him diplomatic immunity. Comics are just weird sometimes. But shortly after this is also when the next Robin was introduced, Tim Drake. Batman did indeed get a replacement Robin after Jason Todd, but not intentionally. It was actually Dick Grayson and Alfred who really brought Tim into the fold, after Tim was able to deduce Batman and Nightwing's secret identities. Dick was the one who brought Tim into the Batcave, unbeknownst to Bruce, and Alfred helped Tim take up the mantle of Robin to rescue Batman and Nightwing from an encounter with Two-Face. In fact, Batman was highly against the idea of a new Robin, and only agreed to let Tim stay once he realized how clever he was, as he helped them multiple times in this battle. So Batman isn't treating Robins like dead goldfish where he ditches them and just gets a new one, but that's certainly how Joker makes it out to be to Jason Todd. Taking a step back though, in the game's prequel comics, Arkham Knight Genesis, Jason's origins are told a bit differently. Instead of his hunt for his mother and going international, everything takes place in Gotham. Jason's downfall is still his rebellious nature though, when Joker attempts to flee during a battle with Batman. Batman realizes it's a trap, but Jason is eager to prove himself and rushes towards Joker. Of course, he ends up getting himself captured, and Batman is unable to track him down. Joker then takes Jason to the basement of Arkham Asylum, where he tortures him for the next two years, leading up to the events of the first game, Batman Arkham Asylum. It's pretty sad knowing that there must have been dozens of times where Batman and the new Robin were just floors above Jason without even knowing it. But this is why during the hallucination that the floors are marked with Arkham Asylum symbols, since that's where Joker kept him in this continuity. Getting back to the game though, the Tim Drake Robin returns and we continue towards our next Joker, Johnny Charisma. Charisma has locked himself in the next room and requested that only Batman enter it. He failed to give us the code to the door though, so Batman calls Henry Adam to access the security footage on the Bat computer. Henry states that he's not great with computers, but he manages to locate it and send it to Batman. 
From here, we can see Charisma punching the code in the mirror. The code is 0539, which is an easter egg for Batman's comic debut in May 1939. Yes, he's that old. However, if you repeatedly fail to get the code right, Batman will just smash the panel. This is taking too long. Once we're inside the room, we find Charisma wearing a bomb vest and standing on the stage. There are also bombs scattered around the room, so things are pretty serious. At least until you get on the stage with Charisma and learn he wants to sing you a song. Charisma has clearly taken on Joker's more theatrical personality traits, and the camera even pans to reveal the perspective of Joker singing to us. Unfortunately, I can't play the song, but I'm sure you get the idea. I thought it was also cool that the music here can be heard in the diner as well, making the music in the diner subtly very Joker-themed. Thematically, it's like he's looming in the background, out of view but still present. While Charisma is distracted though, Robin sneaks in through the vents. We get to control him, and we have to carefully get to each bomb and defuse them without getting caught. After taking care of the bombs, Robin will then defuse Charisma's bomb vest, and they'll take him down together. With Charisma dealt with, that leaves only Albert King, the Goliath. Robin carries Charisma back to his cell, and we get another head start. On our way to Goliath, we come across a rug hanging from a chain. Uncovering it reveals Jason Todd again, as we're haunted by another flashback hallucination. In this one, Joker further breaks down Jason Todd and even intends to brand his face with the letter J. We get to hear this happen, and it's pretty unsettling. No, 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 please, please, no, no! <laughs> Batman shakes it off though, and together with Robin, they confront Goliath. He seems to have Joker's more aggressive personality traits and wants to fight us. This leads to another team combat encounter, and it's just as enjoyable as the prior ones. After defeating Goliath, Batman makes Robin carry him back to his cell, which seems pretty cruel. Robin's been getting his squats in though, since he's actually able to pick up Goliath and carry him back. Before leaving, we can explore another room near this set, and it has a lot of pyrotechnics in it, along with a movie poster for The Inferno. This is a reference to the villain Firefly, aka Garfield Linz, who before becoming a villain, worked for the movie studio as an effects artist and pyrotechnic on the Inferno film. In the back computer files, we learn that although the movie won awards, it was a financial flop. Garfield was then asked to meet with head of the studio, Tommaso Panessa, who while smoking a cigar, fired him. Garfield reacted by spitting nitroglycerin at him, lighting him on fire. Looking at the movie poster again, it seems Garfield took inspiration from the suit depicted on the poster since it's very reminiscent of his Firefly suit. After leaving this room, we head back to the main lockup and go into the underground vents in an attempt to get the upper hand on Harley's guards. Harley shows up first though, putting a wrench in our plans. Robin then steps up to distract Harley and lower her guard. I really love the characterization of this Robin and how he understands that villains see him as lesser to Batman and how that gives him the power of underestimation. He also has a good line where he uses that as a jab against Harley. Oh, look who it is! Batman's little helper! Looks like he left you all alone! Nah, he figured I could handle you by myself. He doesn't take you very seriously. Neither do I. He's successful too, as this gets Harley to unlock the gate and put her in position for Batman to take her down, even though it also puts himself at risk. You can actually betray Robin here if you neglect to jump out the vents and take down Harley. As time goes on, you can feel both Robin and Harley start to get really agitated with you. I'm counting to three! If you don't get out here by the time I finish, Bud Brain here gets it! Okay, I'm starting! One! In case you didn't hear it, I've started! I'm on one already! Okay... Yeah, I'm kind of in agreement. Any time now would be good. If you let this go on even longer, you'll get some additional lines from Harley regarding Jason Todd, including a unique death screen after she shoots Robin. Did the B-Man ever tell you about Jason Todd? I'm guessing not. That's his guilty little secret. Jay said it was special. Said it was his finest work. You know, it's funny. Seems Batman's got a habit of leaving Robin to die! Looks like history's repeating itself, kid! Ha! <laughs> 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 Joker told me Robin's die easy! When you play this scene correctly though, you'll hop out of the vent and help Robin take down Harley and her men. 
We'll continue forward, carrying Goliath and Harley back to the holding cells. When we arrive though, we're met with a grisly sight. Both Christina and Charisma have been shot dead in their cells. It's then revealed that Henry Adams was the one who killed them, and that he's been pretending to be immune to Joker's infection this entire time. In fact, he might be the most dangerous of them all, since it seems he's acquired Joker's cunning and maniacal nature. While the others have been obviously evil, Henry has been plotting. We learn he was lying about being bad with computers, and actually managed to reprogram Batman's security in the studios. In one of the unlockable files, we also learn that Henry was the one who tipped off Harley, and that's why she was able to locate and infiltrate the studio. Henry has one quirk that even Harley can't get behind though, and that's Henry's desire to purify the gene pool and kill the less worthy Jokers. This ends up being his downfall when he realizes that Batman is the final and better Joker, so he decides to shoot himself. Harley is distraught at all the Jokers she just lost, and Robin realizes that Batman is the final Joker. Batman tells him he'll lock himself up after beating Scarecrow, but Robin doesn't want to take the risk, since he knows he won't be able to stop him if he turns. Robin suggests that we get in the cell now, while our Joker hallucination tells us not to, giving us some nice devil on the shoulder, angel on the other imagery. You're ultimately forced to enter the cell though, where Batman takes off his mask and goes into first person mode. Alfred then calls in to tell us that the Arkham Knight's forces have found our location, and are getting ready to attack. With Batman subdued, Robin has to handle it alone. As confident and skilled as we know he is, you can't help but feel a little bit nervous for him as you watch him head out. You know he's not quite ready for this, and that he's probably running off to his death. We're left to ponder this in our cell for a while too, until we're hit with our final Jason Todd hallucination. In this one, we see how broken Jason is, as Joker manages to push him to the point of revealing Batman's true identity on camera. Before Jason can reveal the name, Joker shoots him, not wanting to spoil the mystery. Joker's last message to Batman in this tape is important too. After all, You've seen what happens when you drag your friends into this crazy little game of ours. We saw that same quote written on the wall during our hallucination of Barbara's injury, showing that this line is stuck in Bruce's head for a long time now, having failed both Barbara and Jason. Once we return to reality, we learn that going into the cell was a separate hallucination, and almost more of a premonition of what's to come if we choose to lock ourselves up, and we're given the choice again. This time we can legitimately choose what to do, and if you decide to go back into the cell again, Joker will keep returning and having us choose again. We break this loop when we decide to throw Robin into the cell instead, really pissing him off. After seeing that hallucination, Batman is scared to lose another Robin, and is locking him up in hopes of keeping him safe. He also cuts his communication so he can't reach out to Alfred, so we'll just leave him in here. Although, if you really want to pour salt in the wound, you can take this moment to tell him Barbara is dead as well, which angers him further. Tim, there's... It's something you need to know. Something's happened. No. Not her. Don't say it. Barbara's... She's dead. I'm sorry. Let me out. I can't. They're targeting everyone close to me. I won't let them get you as well. Bruce, please. I have to do this. No. You son of a bitch! How dare you! You don't get to decide! Get away from me! Go! We can also talk to Harley Quinn while she's locked in her cell, and I found this to be very reminiscent of how we left her in Arkham Asylum. From here, we head back to the city and continue our pursuit of the Arkham Knight. We return back to Ivy to talk with her, but Alfred interrupts, stating that the Batwing has managed to locate the Cloudburst, and that it's currently moving through the city. Before we can do anything about it, the Cloudburst is triggered, covering Gotham in a cloud of fear toxin and disabling the Batmobile. Batman and Ivy were luckily on a rooftop when it happened, but everyone who was on the streets are now tearing each other apart. Even worse, the toxin is killing Ivy's plants, their only solution for getting rid of the toxin. Ivy chooses to stay with her plants to help keep them alive, although we can see that it causes her a great deal of pain to sustain them. Our goal now is to destroy the Cloudburst, but we'll need the Batmobile to do so. Batman's plan is to return back to Simon Stagg, since he helped develop the Cloudburst, and see if he has a solution. We find him hiding beneath a floor grate, so we pick him up and interrogate him for answers. He tells us that we need to insert a Nimbus cell into the Batmobile, so we lock him up and take one for ourselves. From here, we head back to the Batmobile, and our only choice is to dive into the Fear Toxin Cloud. The Fear Toxin amplifies Joker's hold on us, so this is a big risk. While we replace the cell, we can see that Joker is getting stronger, as the criminals in the background transition into hallucinations of him. We manage to safely get into the Batmobile though, and our next order of business is to awaken another one of Ivy's plants. We eventually find it, and it clears as much of the toxin as it can, but it's still not enough. Thankfully, the Arkham Knight decides he wants to finish us now, so he challenges us to face off against him while he drives the Cloudburst tank. 
This leads to a boss fight using the Batmobile, where we have to quietly destroy the Arkham Knight's powerful Cobra tanks before we can take him on. The Cobra tanks only have one weak point, so you have to position yourself behind them and lock on before you're able to blow them up. I thought these encounters were pretty tense, and they're basically Batmobile stealth missions. The Cloudburst is an even more deadly version of the Cobra tank though, but with multiple weak points that each need to be damaged once. I actually like this battle against the Cloudburst a lot, due to its cat and mouse style gameplay. You'll creep up on the tank and blast one of its weak points, then drive away at top speed to evade its blast. The Cloudburst is quick, relentless, and has some really damaging weapons, making it a formidable opponent. So I thought it was a really good boss fight aimed at the Batmobile. However, I do have some criticisms with how it fares as an Arkham Knight battle, but we'll talk about that more later. For now, we destroy the Cloudburst and grapple the Arkham Knight up to a nearby rooftop. The fight continues, but in cutscene form, until Batman knocks him out and has another inconveniently timed Joker hallucination. Batman leaves the Arkham Knight there and returns back to Poison Ivy. Ivy is able to resuscitate her plants back to full health, but doing so came at a cost. This sapped the last of Ivy's life force as she starts to disintegrate in Batman's arms, covering Gotham in pollen as her plants remove Scarecrow's fear toxin from the skies. Gotham City is safe again, thanks to the sacrifice of Poison Ivy. Although I'm not certain she's dead for good. After she disintegrates, all that's left of her is her red jacket lying on the ground. However, if we return back to it later in the game, a flower is now sprouting from it. You could interpret this as just a nice symbol that something beautiful has grown in the place of Ivy's sacrifice, but I've always taken it to be a sign of rebirth, that she might not be as dead as we thought, but I'm curious what you all think. From here though, we return back to the GCPD. They've managed to intercept an encrypted SWAT broadcast in Gotham, which is suspicious since SWAT isn't there. Batman is able to decrypt it, and it's a message Gordon sent some of his men, stating that he's located Scarecrow and he's going to put an end to him. There's no way Jim is going to be able to handle Scarecrow alone, so Batman tracks his radio signal. That signal brings us to an abandoned shopping mall, where Gordon has already got himself captured, and he's taken underground via elevator. We follow him using the Batmobile, underground through the tunnel system. Unfortunately, the Arkham Knight has been waiting for us in his new vehicle, a drilling machine, and he makes a reference to the Batman Begins movie. I did ask if it came in black, but then I thought, ah, you just get all jealous. Does it come in black? He then chases us through the tunnels, but luckily, some bombs have been planted along the edges that damage the Knight's vehicle. There are a few other tunnels like this one with the bombs, so our goal now is to lure the Arkham Knight into the mall. Like with the Cloudburst tank, I thought this was a fun Batmobile-centric boss fight, and it was tense navigating the obstacles of the tunnel with the Knight close on my tail. However, I'm also beginning to wish I could fight the Arkham Knight hand-to-hand -hand, instead of always through a vehicle. Regardless, after luring him through all the bombs, we find a potential exit through a vent in the ceiling. Right on cue though, the Arkham Knight shows up, believing he has us trapped. He also takes a moment to reveal that he was the one who told Scarecrow how to find Barbara, and that he knows Bruce Wayne is Batman, but he's kept that secret to himself for now. Before the Arkham Knight can crush him, Batman ejects out the car and through the vent, but the Batmobile was destroyed in the process. If Batman could cry, I think this would be one of those moments. Still, we have bigger concerns, and that's rescuing Gordon, who's just in the next room. He's surrounded by militia troops, so we jump in and take them all out. Before we get a chance to untie Gordon, the Arkham Knight shows back up, this time ready to reveal his identity. If you haven't guessed it already, it's Jason Todd, the Robin that Batman thought was dead. For fans that were familiar with the comics, this reveal was pretty predictable, with many fans guessing the Arkham Knight's true identity before the game even released. Even if it's not a highly effective twist, I still think Jason Todd is a good antagonist for this game's story. Having a shadow of the past mysteriously return for the hero to face is typically a concept in storytelling that I enjoy, and that applies here with Jason, especially since so much of the story has been built around him, and I like how it's been paired with the Joker. Throughout the game so far, we've been getting a lot of good character moments for Batman, where we get to witness some of his biggest regrets. Since Batman is so internal, I think hallucinations were a good way to demonstrate these regrets, namely the attack on Barbara and the death of Jason Todd. Now having Jason return face to face with him, you can imagine how Bruce must feel. On the one hand, he sees the consequences of his failure to save Jason and how it's warped his mind. On the other hand, Bruce now has a second chance to save Jason and put him on the right path again. But what about Jason's arc in the comics and how does it tie in with the game? So Jason did stay dead for quite a while in the comics until he was brought back in a series called Under the Red Hood. Jason Todd is Red Hood and his introduction in the comics is similar to the one he gets as Arkham Knight, where he's a mysterious new player in Gotham that quickly makes a name for himself. Red Hood is primarily targeting the villain Black Mask in this series, but he'll also cross paths with Batman, leading to the two of them to duke it out until one fight where Jason reveals himself to Bruce. 
We also learn why Jason carries a grudge against Batman, and it's a little different from how the game portrays it. In Arkham Knight, Jason is upset that not only did Bruce fail to save him the whole time he was being held by Joker, but he also replaced him with a new Robin shortly after his disappearance. In the comics, Jason says he forgives Bruce for not saving him. His issue is that Batman didn't kill the Joker for what he did to him. He states that if the Joker had killed Bruce, he would have made sure to hunt down Joker and murder him. But Bruce has just let the Joker live repeatedly after all the crimes and murders he's committed following Jason's death. With Joker being dead in the Arkham continuity, I guess that motivation wouldn't really work for this game, so I think the direction they went here was still effective. But how exactly did Jason return from the dead in both the comics and the game? In the comics, it's revealed that in a separate series, Superboy Prime altered certain moments in time, one of which was Jason Todd's death. This reanimated Jason in his coffin, and he was able to break free like a zombie. A zombie might not actually be too far off, because he suffered a lot of brain trauma in that beating from Joker, and was pretty much just moving around based on pure instinct. He ended up living on the streets again until a homeless man recognized Jason's fighting moves, pinpointing him as Robin. This same homeless man also had connections to Talia al Ghul, Bruce's former love interest, and she arranged to pick him up and take care of him. She trained him as much as she could, but the trauma from his death was still too severe, so she threw him into the Lazarus Pit, which brought him back to full health and recovered his memories. In the prequel comic for the game, we learn that Jason managed to escape captivity during the chaos of the first game and had a little help from Deathstroke, who Jason bribes to help him escape. This also forms the backbone of their relationship in the game, but we'll talk about Deathstroke a bit later. Going back to the game though, I like this nod we get to Jason's Red Hood identity as the Arkham Knight outfit transitions into a hybrid of the two. Jason's not ready to forgive Batman yet, so he's on the hunt once again, taking us into another boss fight. Thankfully, this one won't take place in the Batmobile, and is instead more of a stealth fight. Jason has taken up a sniping position, so we have to sneak around and catch him off guard. Each time we're able to grab him, Batman makes an attempt to talk him down. These are some of my favorite moments between the two of them, mostly due to the performance of Troy Baker, voicing Jason Todd. As Batman speaks to him, you can tell Red Hood is really conflicted with how to feel. He's still driven by the vengeance he wants against Batman, but you also get a sense that deep down, he wants to go back to that father-son relationship that they used to have, and I think the voice acting really delivers that, with the wobbliness of Jason's voice in these moments. Joker got to you. I know what it's like. Don't pretend to understand! After we catch him for the final time, they get a brief moment to talk, and Bruce reaches out to him. You did this to me. I'm sorry. You left me to rot in that abandoned wing of Arkham for over a year! With him! It's not too late. We can fix this. Together. And with that, they both come to a silent truce, as Batman gives Alfred the news that Jason Todd is back. In that time, Jason took the opportunity to escape. With the Arkham Knight taken care of, we can now return to rescuing Gordon. He tells us that Scarecrow is on the top floor, so we ride the elevator to get there. During the ride, Batman takes a moment to apologize for everything with Barbara, and mentions what an honor it was to work alongside her. Gordon must have heard Jason call us Bruce during the fight, since he now addresses us as such, recalling the day he first met Bruce after getting his witness statement the night his parents were murdered. The knowledge of Bruce's identity seems to have disarmed Gordon a bit, and he treats us more calmly, even apologizing and stating that they're similar, and you get the sense that they've made amends. Once they reach the rooftop, Gordon and Batman confront Scarecrow together. This is one of my favorite cutscenes in the game, because there's so much going on within it. Batman thinks that they finally apprehended Scarecrow and that he's got his friend back, but just like that, Gordon points the gun at Batman, stating that this betrayal was the only way he could secure his daughter. At that moment, Barbara is wheeled out, and you realize that Batman must have hallucinated her death. You actually get a couple of teases at this reveal ahead of time, too. Before dropping into the penthouse, it looks like there's a gas being expelled into Batman's side of the room, potentially a subtle fear gas. Another clue is during the actual death scene, where you see the Joker push the gun towards her. If he's a figment of Bruce's imagination, he shouldn't be able to move things in the real world. Lastly, if you return to this location before the reveal, Barbara will be missing, and it'll be Joker in the chair. Hang on, did you leave something here? It was sort of uh, body-shaped, wasn't it? During this cutscene, you'll also notice the camera is circling them this entire time, and although it can be slightly nauseating, I think Rocksteady chose this camera movement to elevate the feeling of confusion in the scene. The way the camera is moving, it feels like things are spiraling out of control, which is pretty cool if that was the intention. Things go back and forth quite a lot too, as Gordon attempts to turn the gun back on Scarecrow, who counters by bringing in more guards as he tells Gordon that his next decision will decide the fate of Barbara. Gordon then chooses to shoot Batman, but he aims for Batman's chest. 
We've been told by the Arkham Knight multiple times now that he knows our armor is strongest around the bat symbol, and it seems Gordon knew this too. Scarecrow didn't catch on though, and was actually mad at Gordon for attempting to kill Batman. Scarecrow doesn't want Batman dead yet, and he goes back on his deal with Gordon, wheeling Barbara to the edge of the roof, and it's definitely one of Scarecrow's creepiest moments. You don't scare me. Shh. It's okay to be afraid. <laughs> Batman swoops in to rescue her, and they land safely on the ground. They're not out of the woods just yet though, as a bunch of militia tanks swarm their location. This would be a great time to use the Batmobile, but it was crushed by the Arkham Knight. Coincidentally, I guess, Batman had a secret spare lying around that he calls in to save them. I think the first car looked cooler personally, but I do like the grey and yellow color scheme for a more classic Batman feel. From here though, Batman takes Barbara to the police station, where she resumes her work as Oracle. Her first order of business is to track down Scarecrow and her dad. She starts to make some progress, but it's interrupted when the building starts to shake. Scarecrow has sent the rest of his forces to lay siege on the police department, and things aren't looking good. Before Batman heads out to examine things, you can also have some unique conversations with whoever's at the GCPD at the time. For example, if you've been doing a lot of side missions and locking away criminals, the ones who are there will reference the attack, such as Deacon Blackfire, who we'll see more of in Part 2 of Batman Arkham Knight. I knew it. The Lord is answering my prayers. This building be tumbling down, Batman, just like the walls of Jericho. You also get a pretty fun moment from Jack Ryder if you visit him during the siege. Stay the hell back! Oh, Batman, it's you. Easy there, big guy. I nearly took you out. Eventually, we head to the roof to get a better idea of what we're up against, and it's pretty daunting to see this many militia tanks all grouped together, and yes, we have to fight all of them. If you end up dying during the sequence, there's a pretty intense death scene that follows, where Scarecrow's forces go full, no Russian, on the GCPD. That definitely demonstrates what's at stake here, so we don't want to mess this up. Thankfully, we're not taking on the militia completely alone, as Oracle has found a way to hack some of their drones and take control of them. Just that minor aspect alone made this battle a lot more fun, since you really feel like you're working as a team, especially when Oracle can prime one of the drones to detonate when shot. I thought that was a fun way to freshen up the Batmobile combat, and I enjoyed this encounter quite a bit. We get a similar team up in the next phase of the battle, which takes place on the rooftop of the GCPD. This will be a hand-to-hand -hand battle, and Oracle has the ability to control parts of the environment for takedowns. She'll call out when certain environmental takedowns are ready, and we can throw an enemy into them. I thought this was a clever way to let us fight alongside Oracle, and it ended up being a really enjoyable combat sequence. These are the last of the henchmen though, and after defeating them, we've saved the GCPD. We don't have any time to celebrate though, as Oracle has located Scarecrow, and he's managed to gain access to the movie studios, where we left Robin locked up defenseless. By the time we get there, Scarecrow has already kidnapped him. Scarecrow then sends us a message, stating that he's got both Gordon and Robin locked up, and that if we want them to live, we'll have to go to a storage depot in Kingston. We don't have much of a choice, so we do as Scarecrow says. We might have one saving grace though, since when we arrive, there's a red symbol painted on the wall, and that's Red Hood's symbol, indicating that Jason is watching over us. Inside, we're greeted by another message from Scarecrow. He tells us to leave our utility belt on the table and enter the storage truck. Batman reluctantly agrees and walks into the truck. As it drives away, Alfred calls us to tell us that someone is tracking our movements. This must be Jason Todd, so we might have a slight edge on Scarecrow now. During the drive though, the truck is hit and sent tumbling. When we exit, we're back in Crime Alley, the location where Bruce's parents were murdered. When we try to pay our respects, Joker shows up and starts a massive brawl against us. As you fight off the Jokers, you're able to perform takedowns on them, and Batman will perform much more brutal takedowns than he normally would. After doing enough of these, you're given the opportunity to kill the Joker. The game forces you to snap his neck, which transitions you back to the truck, as Joker seems to have progressed further into taking over. We next get a cutscene showing the path the truck is traveling, and this entire sequence mirrors the opening cinematic from Batman Arkham Asylum, where Batman drove Joker to the asylum. Scarecrow taking us to Arkham Asylum is fitting, and I like that Rocksteady are going for the thematics of the series ending where it began. It's pretty cool to see inside the asylum now too, as it's still overrun with Ivy's plants, and doesn't appear to have been touched since we were last there. We can even tell where exactly Scarecrow has us placed, based on the statue in the background, and it's bringing back a lot of nostalgia to the events of Arkham Asylum. We can also see that Crane has gone to a lot of trouble to set this up. Gordon and Robin are tied up nearby, and the media is already aware of our capture and potential unmasking. 
Scarecrow is succeeding in his plan, and the end seems close. Enough bravado. It's too late for that. I don't care who you are, but they will. I'm going to rob them of hope. As they stare into your eyes, they will blame you. Failure will have a face and a name. It's time. Mr. Gordon, I would like you to do the honors. Never. I'm done taking orders from you. You bastard! Take off that mask, or my next shot will kill him. It's okay. It's not okay! You know what this means. It's the end. When they find out who you are, there'll be no hiding. You need to trust me, Jim. Now! With the fear toxin in our system, we transition into Bruce's mind as we see Two-Face, Killer Croc, Penguin, and Riddler decide what to do with us. Except it's not Batman that they're discussing, it's Joker. The fear toxin seems to have elevated Joker's control in Batman's mind once again, to the point he's in control now. Joker even calls in his own version of the Batmobile, and it's a pretty clever design. With the mouth on the front and the hands and feet above each wheel, it takes the theme of blending man and machine more literally, in a way that's perfectly creepy for the Joker. Almost like a giant clown has been stuffed into the car. From here, we get to obliterate all the thugs in the area, and the finishing touch is a missile launch called The Killing Joke, a nod to the comic we've discussed a few times in this video. When Joker hops out of the vehicle, he's wielding a shotgun, and this section becomes a third-person shooter. We'll then enter the building and shoot all of our rivals. Penguin is first, begging for us to spare him, but we'll shoot him anyway. By the way, this is another key section that the ESRB listed as deserving of an M rating, since we're shooting a lot of unarmed people. The Riddler part especially, since he decides to take a hostage. You can either choose to just kill the Riddler, or you can kill the hostage to get to the Riddler and kill him too, which is probably the most Joker thing to do. Although killing or sparing the hostage doesn't seem to impact the game. We'll next take out Two-Face, and after doing so, he turns into Gordon and begs us to stop, which I interpret to be a piece of Bruce's consciousness trying to take back control. Joker then leaves the building, and we get a vision of Gotham on fire, a glorious image for the Joker, and Batman's greatest fear. We then transition back to the real world as Scarecrow continues to try and intimidate us, not knowing that Joker is taking control of the body. Do you not understand? It is over. Get ready for the encore. <laughs> Why aren't you scared? We transition back into Bruce's mind, and the battle for it continues. The burning Gotham City starts to black out, as we're taken to a new location. Joker turns on his flashlight, and the first thing we see is a portrait of Batman carrying Joker's dead body. This is actually a repurposed concept art from Arkham City, and I think it was used well here. Batman is attempting to take back control by triggering Joker with different images. Crispy. For example, we stumble upon Joker's funeral and see that nobody attended except for Harley. Batman is playing on Joker's fear of being forgotten, and it seems to work pretty well. In another room, you can find a couple newspaper articles. One of them reads, Harley Quinn and Riddler expecting first child, which might actually be scarier for Harley. Another reads, Joker dies, Gotham doesn't care. During a radio broadcast, they also mention that Batman's arch nemesis is now the Penguin, which must be another low blow to Joker. 
When we head outside, we get a really cool moment where Batman statues will spawn in while we're not looking. It's really creepy and gives you the feeling of what it's like to be hunted by Batman, that he could be right behind you at any moment. Even scarier though is that Batman actually bursts out of one of the statues and attacks us. This takes us back to Arkham Asylum, as Joker calls in a mobile cell, probably as a method of escape. This is reminiscent of one of their earlier moments in Batman Arkham Asylum, where Joker escaped on one of these too. Unfortunately for him, this time it's occupied by Batman, who's on the offensive. There's no escaping him, and he grabs Joker, delivering one of his iconic lines from Batman the Animated Series. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. He then throws Joker into the cell and sends him away, symbolically locking away the Joker deep in the recesses of his mind. This takes us back to reality as we can visually see that Bruce has shaken off the Joker's influence. Scarecrow is still trying to prove his point that he has broken Batman, but it's not working. Bruce has mentally vanquished his fears, and as a result, is able to resist Scarecrow's toxin. Out of desperation, Scarecrow gets ready to shoot him, when Red Hood jumps in, shooting the gun out of his hand as well as the bindings holding Bruce. Still on live TV, Bruce injects Scarecrow with his own toxin, and he sees a nightmarish Batman coming towards him surrounded by fire. More on that later. Gordon gets the final punch, knocking out Scarecrow, something I think he's definitely earned. From here, Batman says his goodbyes to Gordon and asks him to watch over everyone. He also tells him that he's been there since the beginning, and now he gets to see how it ends. That's pretty ominous, so what exactly is Bruce planning? The next we see of Batman, he's telling Alfred to activate the Nightfall Protocol, likely a reference to the comic series Nightfall, where Bane breaks Batman physically. Before you activate the Nightfall Protocol, you can still explore the city, complete side missions, and talk with NPCs. They'll all have a comment about you being Bruce Wayne now, so it's pretty cool to hear what everyone thinks about your secret identity. For example, here's another clip from Jack Ryder. Look, I uh, just want to say sorry for all those things I said to you about Bruce Wayne and uh, all those things I said to Bruce Wayne about Batman. Another cool easter egg can be found if you return back to Panessa Studios. Red Hood has been here and left his symbol painted on the ground, which is pretty intriguing to say the least. But now let's get to the actual ending. If you haven't completed all of the side missions in the game, you'll only get half the ending, but once you've locked up all of Gotham's major criminals, you're ready for the full Nightfall Protocol. Batman will leave his cowl on the ground by the bat signal and call Gordon to let him know that the city is safe again. Bruce takes one last lingering look out into the city before calling the Batwing to take him away. We then cut to Wayne Manor as Vicki Vale reports live. Also on the right side of the screen, we can see another appearance from game director Septon Hill. Batman then swoops in with the Batwing, and during the media panic, for a brief moment, we can see the back of Calendar Man's head. In Arkham City, he had a secret message where he basically says to Batman what he said to Gordon. Days were the secret, Batman, and the end of days is coming. I was there at your beginning, and I will be there at your end. He's stuck to his word, since he is in fact present for Batman's end, and it's also Halloween, which I'm sure makes Calendar Man even happier. We next see Bruce enter the mansion, where he's greeted by Alfred. Alfred asks him one last time if he's sure he wants to do this, to which Bruce says yes. They close the doors, and then a huge explosion destroys Wayne Manor. We then cut back to the logo of the burning bat symbol, with Gordon's voiceover saying that this is how the Batman died. Gordon's voiceover continues as he fills us in on what the city has been like since Batman's death. He starts by saying that criminals are a cowardly and superstitious lot, an iconic line spoken by Batman in his earlier comics. We also see a text he received from Tim Drake, requesting he bring the ring, so it looks like Tim is finally about to propose to Barbara. In the city, we can also see posters announcing the election of Jim Gordon as mayor, so things are definitely looking up for Gotham. Gordon also mentions that they're still looking into who might have killed Bruce Wayne, so it seems the primary belief is that a criminal killed him after learning his identity. We then cut to a family, very reminiscent of a young Bruce Wayne and his parents the night of their murder. Similarly, they go to the back of the theater where they're jumped by two men, one of which we can actually see at the diner at the beginning of the game. We also get the iconic shot of the pearls dropping to the floor to further drive home that this is mirroring the way Bruce Wayne's parents died, although this time, someone is there to stop them. The criminals look up in the distance as a shadowy bat creature bursts into flames and descends upon them. And that ends the story of Batman Arkham Knight. So what the hell does that ending mean? Are the thugs on Fear Toxin? Did somebody else take up the mantle? It's definitely open to interpretation, but game director Sefton Hill has shed some light on the ending via Reddit. When asked about some of his favorite moments from each game, he had this to say about Arkham Knight. I liked the very end. When Batman is left with no other option, he still manages to find a way out, to become an even more badass version of Batman. How cool is that? 
So what Septon seems to be alluding to is what I think many of us hoped, that Batman is still alive. I think that makes the most sense too, since it seems like a strange choice to have Batman commit suicide, especially when you factor in that the mansion blew up with Alfred still inside. There's no way Bruce would force Alfred to die too. Another criminal could have blown them up, specifically Calendar Man since that fits his MO, but I've always got the vibe that this is exactly how Bruce planned for the Nightfall Protocol to go. My interpretation of the end scene is that Bruce has faked his own death. Now with Bruce Wayne out of the picture, he can be Batman full time, which I think is what he wants most. Many fans in the past have pointed out that Bruce Wayne is the true mask, that underneath it all, he's Batman and Bruce Wayne is the act. So Bruce going full time Batman seems very much in character, and I think that's a solid way to go with him. So looking back at these final shots of the game, where we see Batman from the criminal's perspective, it's still tough to decipher what exactly is going on. The way they're perceiving Batman is very similar to the way Scarecrow saw him when he was injected with Fear Toxin, leading many to believe that Batman has weaponized Scarecrow's toxin for his own purposes. I think that's a pretty good theory, but I personally look at it more symbolically. The way Batman is bursting into fire as he takes flight, I take it to be a phoenix metaphor as Batman is rising from the ashes of his death. I think if Batman is re-emerging so unexpectedly, he's also likely striking fear in the hearts of criminals in a new way, making him almost mythological, similar to when he first arrived in Gotham. So from the thug's perspective, their fear is likely elevating Batman's appearance, and this shot is symbolizing him becoming a mythological creature of the night again. That's at least how I perceive this, but I'm curious how you all interpret this final cutscene. But what about the story overall? Well, I think it was pretty damn good, personally. I think everyone gets good character arcs, and I like Batman's journey. In the prior games, Batman went through some long nights that physically pushed him to his limits, but this one really tests him mentally and emotionally. If that was Rocksteady's goal for this game, then I think the villain choices were perfect as well. Scarecrow is one of my favorite villains in the comics due to his ability to bring Batman's fears to life, and it's always interesting to see how that affects Bruce. This Scarecrow is far more cunning and menacing too, which makes him a believable threat. And even though many feel that the Jason Todd reveal was too predictable, that's never really bothered me because the strength of the twist isn't the hook for me in this game. It's his character arc and how his reappearance affects Bruce. To me, the Arkham Knight is Batman's toughest foe throughout the game, which I think is fitting since Batman's biggest threat is the one he unknowingly created. Jason is the embodiment of one of Bruce's biggest failures and regrets too, so I think it's cool to see that come back to haunt him, and how that also gives him the opportunity for a second chance. I also like the theme of redemption for them both. Batman redeems himself by talking Jason down, and Jason redeems himself by pulling himself out of the darkness towards a more heroic path. My one complaint regarding Jason though, is that I feel like his wrap up is a little too quick after his identity is revealed. The way it stands, I think it still works, but I think there's room for more, and I wanted more of an interaction between them, especially since there's been so much build up to this moment. I do however think that the Joker is handled very well in this game. To start, I like that he's reintroduced in Ace Chemicals, since that's essentially the birthplace of the Joker, so it's a fitting place for his rebirth. I think his reveal was effective, and I like that he affects the plot as more of a background character without taking the spotlight from Scarecrow or Jason. I also like that Joker's hold on Bruce is increased by each injection of the fear toxin, amplifying the threat of it in a significant way. So I think these three villains form a cohesive unity for this game, boosting each other both intentionally and unintentionally, and they all fit the theme of internal trauma for Bruce. Along with that, I like that Bruce is forced to make some hard and unpopular decisions throughout the game, and it's interesting to see how those decisions affect the people around him. Throughout the game, characters will feel betrayed by Bruce, he'll lose close allies, and he'll have to earn back their trust, or at the very least, show them what led him to make those decisions so that they understand. We also get a strong sense of the potential risks involved with being Batman's ally. We of course see the attack on Barbara and the death of Jason Todd, but by the end of the game, we also see Gordon and Robin kidnapped. Everyone is caught in the crosshairs, and in these moments, I'm sure Joker's words are echoing in his mind again. After all, you've seen what happens when you drag your friends into this crazy little game of ours. So it's no surprise that by the end of the game, assuming he's still alive, that Bruce plans to take a step backward and work solo again, both for the benefit of his allies, but also for himself. So yeah, I really enjoyed the story of Arkham Knight. The lore may not be as deep as Arkham City, but I like how this game further explores each character and I enjoy the journey it takes them on. It's one that I can still enjoy after multiple playthroughs, and I don't really have any major complaints about it. But I think that wraps up my thoughts on the main story, however there are still tons of topics that I want to discuss in this game, such as the vast amount of DLC content, the gameplay, and the audio design amongst other things. That's a lot of content that will need a dedicated video to itself, so for that reason we'll pick this back up in part 2 of Batman Arkham Knight. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you gave it a like since it helps the channel, and you can subscribe if you'd like to catch Arkham Knight Part 2 when it releases. I also have a ton of other retrospective videos that you can watch in the meantime, including the prior games in the Arkham series. 
But anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.